on Disability Access to Order. Today is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. So uh, to start off, Presley, can you review the meeting protocols? All right, so this full commission meeting will be on Zoom via teleconference and held at the California Commission on Disability Access CCD headquarters located at 400 R Street, Suite 312 in Sacramento, California. Um, virtual attendees are in compliance with Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Please remember to specify the following. If a state body member attends a meeting via teleconference from a remote location, they must disclose any other individuals 18 years or older present in the room as well as their relationship. The visual appearance of a member of the state body on camera may seize only when the apparent appearance would be technologically impractical. Public comment on matters not on the agenda is taken at the beginning of the meeting. Public comment on matters on the agenda will be heard as the commission takes up agenda items for discussion. Public comments are limited to three minutes. Speakers who utilize translators to make public comment will be allotted no more than six minutes unless they utilize simultaneous translation equipment. CCDA is precluded from discussing matters not on the agenda. However, CCDA members may ask questions for clarification purposes. This meeting is being captioned and recorded to assist in this effort. Please state your first and last name each time you speak and speak loud and clear. The Streamtext live captioning link has been included in the chat for your use and staff can provide the link when asked. Public participants can use the raise hand function to alert the committee of when they would like to speak. And we will also give an opportunity for public members who have called into the meeting at which time they can unmute themselves. If you are attending this meeting via teleconference, please press star six on your keypad to unmute yourself. If you would like to alert CCDA, press star nine to telephonically raise your hand and staff will call on you. To use the raise hand function, please follow these steps. First. Click on the icon labeled reactions in the toolbar on the bottom center of your screen. After clicking reactions, a new window will show on your screen. At the bottom right of the screen, there will be a button labeled raise hand. Using Zoom via mobile device, click on the three side dots labeled more. The more option is in the toolbar on the bottom right corner of the screen. After clicking more, a new window will pop up at the bottom of your screen. Press raise hand. Please remember to mute yourself if you are not speaking in order to reduce noise. If you are having technical issues throughout the meeting and need assistance, please use the chat function to alert CCDA staff or email ccda at dgs.ca.gov. If you are unable to use, utilize the chat function to alert CCDA staff, please unmute yourself and request for permission to speak. If there are technical issues that impact the proceeding of the meeting, the body will take the following procedures. One, stay calm and reassure, communicate to all participants that technical issues have occurred and CCA staff is working to resolve them. Number two, backup communication, alternative messaging to all participants, mass email communication from the CCA staff or email from the CCDA at dgs.ca.gov. Number three, an attempt to technical reboot, the CCA staff will attempt to resolve technical issues. And four, um, adjourn meeting if technical issues persist and compromise the meeting's purpose. The meeting will be adjourned and may be rescheduled if necessary. After the housekeeping, I will pass that back to you, Chair Commissioner Downey. Thank you, Presley. Uh, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. And uh, so that brings us to agenda item one, starting with roll call, which brings us back to Presley. Awesome. I am back and we will do roll call. I will start with Chair Commissioner Downey. Present. Uh, Commissioner Guy Lemus. Commissioner Holloway. Present. Commissioner Dillard. Present. Commissioner O'Hessen. Present. Commissioner Jackson. Present. Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Present. Commissioner Lillibridge. Commissioner Lillibridge. Commissioner Profasa. Commissioner Ramirez. Present. Commissioner Shapiro. Present. Commissioner Clare. 
Present. Commissioner Conway. Conway, present. Awesome. And with that, we do have quorum, and I will pass it back to you, Chair Commissioner Downey. Thank you. Thank you, Presley. This is Chair Commissioner Downey. Do we have any other, let's see, legislative members, public officials, or other commissioners here in the meeting? Presley, that was for you. My apologies. Yes, uh, we do have uh, uh, Senator Bogue, Nikki Taylor is here representing. And other than that, I will pass it back to you. Okay, thank you. So this is Chair Commissioner Downey, uh, at this time, are there any members of the public that are uh, attending that would like to identify themselves? Or so are there any members of the public joining us virtually that would like to identify, identify themselves? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. Are they, thank you. Are there any members of the public here in person that, that would like to identify themselves? Chair Commissioner Downey, my apologies. We do have a public member, uh, Mark Baker, with his hand raised. Uh, he is here today representing the public. My name is Mark Baker. I'm president of the Soft Lights Foundation. And I'd like to submit a public comment in my three minutes. Thank you. We'll get to that, uh, that agenda item here in a minute. Thank you. And Chair Commissioner uh, Daphne, we also have Bill Zelmer uh, identifying as a public member. Yep, just wanted to say I'm sitting in on the meeting to uh, assist in any way that I can. Uh, this is Bill Zelmer from Sutter Health. Thank you, Bill. Is there any other members of the public here virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no other indication in the chat. Thank you. And uh, we, do we have any members of the public here in person? Hearing none, it's time for us to move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. So, uh, those that can, please stand. States of America to the Republic for which is one day under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. So uh, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. If there are no further comments, we'll move on to agenda item two, appro approval of the October 25th, 23 uh, full commission hearing meeting minutes. Before hearing a motion to approve, are there any questions or comments on the, uh, any questions, comments, corrections regarding those uh, meeting minutes? This is Commissioner Holloway. I'll move uh, yeah. approval of the minutes. Excuse me. We're waiting for uh, any questions or comments. Are there any questions or comments from members of the commission joining us uh, virtually? There appears to be no indication in the chat, Chair Commissioner Downey. Thank you. Are there any members of the commission here in person that would uh, like to address this item? Hearing none, are there any members of the public that would like to offer a correction uh, comment regarding the meeting minutes? Finally, are there any uh, members of the public joining us virtually uh, in person that would like to address the meeting minutes? Okay, Thank hearing none. Now I'd like to request a motion to approve. Don't move it again. Commissioner Jack Dillett, second. 
Thank you. So, Presley, that requires a roll call vote. Can you take care of that for us, please? Yes. Awesome. I will get started. Uh, Chair Commissioner Downey. Aye. Commissioner Dillard. Aye. Commissioner Elhessen. Aye. Commissioner Holloway. Aye. Commissioner Jackson. Aye. Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Aye. Awesome. Uh, Commissioner Lillibridge. Commissioner Profasa. Aye. Commissioner Ramirez. Aye. Commissioner Shapiro. Mm -hmm. Chair Commissioner Downey, all CCDA commissioner votes have been noted. Uh, the motion carries. I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Presley. If, uh, if there are no further comments, we'll move on to agenda item three. Okay, now it's time for members' uh, comments for members of the public on items that are not on the agenda. But first, are there any member comments for members of the public joining us virtually? Yes, yes, Mr. Baker would like to speak. Okay, please, uh, Mr. Baker. Hi, um, my name is Mark Baker. I'm founder and president of the Soft Lights Foundation. The Soft Lights Foundation advocates for the protection of individuals with disabilities who cannot neurologically tolerate the visible light radiation emitted by products using light emitting diodes. The widespread release of LED products such as LED floodlights, LED strip lights, and LED flashing lights has created a new type of discriminatory barrier that is not currently addressed by government regulations or standards. LEDs emit an intense directed energy light that can overwhelm the nervous system of individuals with epilepsy, autism, migraine, PTSD, and others. The adverse impacts of LED light include seizure, migraine, panic attack, nausea, loss of motor functioning, impaired cognitive functioning, fear, anxiety, and psychological trauma. The use of an LED light can create a discriminatory barrier that prevents full and equal access to a business by blocking the path of travel. For example, there are LED floodlights that are so intense, I personally cannot look in the direction of the floodlight. If that floodlight is placed in front of a grocery store, then I cannot access that grocery store without suffering a neurological or psychological injury. This is discrimination. Agencies such as the US Access Board, Pacific ADA Center, and the CCDA have no educational or training materials for businesses for how to provide accommodation related to LED lights. Therefore, we ask that the California Commission on Disability Access open an investigation into this issue. The Soft Lights Foundation has expertise on this topic and is available to assist the commission. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Baker. Are there any other, comment, other comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Thank you. Are there any comments from members of the public that are joining us here uh, pers uh, in person? So I presume there are no members of the public here in person, uh, which uh, by the agenda, we need to move on to agenda item four. But first, I'd like to take care of a procedural issue i'd like to uh make like to request uh, a motion to approve um an adjustment to the agenda to switch to flip items five and six um so that we can uh, have uh, the benefit of someone to join in virtually uh, to address item five and she won't be here until later so if we can uh i'd like to have uh if there are no questions comments on this, I'd like to see if we could have a motion to approve. Commissioner Shapiro moves that we switch the items in the agenda that you referred to. 
Thank you. Can I have a second? Commissioner Jacqueline Jackson, second. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. So uh, for that, we'll need a roll, roll call vote. So I believe that brings us back to Presley. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I will start the vote. Commissioner Downey? Aye. Commissioner Dillard? Commissioner Aye. Dillard? Awesome. Commissioner O'Hessen? Aye. Commissioner Holloway? Aye. Commissioner Jackson? Aye. Commissioner Leon Vasquez? Aye. Commissioner Lillibridge? Commissioner Profasa? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. And Commissioner Shapiro? Aye. All right, Chair Commissioner Downey, all CCDA commissioners have voted and been noted and the motion carries. I will pass Thank it back you. to you. Thank you, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. My mic, there we go. Uh, this is Chair Commissioner Downey, thank you for that adjustment. And so now we'll move on to agenda item four. Uh, so that brings us to updates and discussions regarding the uh, uh, Bagley King. And for that, we'll need to uh, refer this item to our Commissioner uh, April Dawson. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. And I wanted to uh, share that there have been recent changes to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Uh, and those changes affect the way that we need to run our meetings. And so we have a, a guest today, OLS Attorney Biana Barbu. Uh, we'll be giving a few highlights of these uh, recent changes. And I just wanna share that if there are specific questions that relate to your personal situation as a commissioner, um, please email me or call me after the meeting so that I can arrange to get that specific question answered um, through our um, the Office of Legal Services. Uh, but we can definitely uh, discuss in general the, the changes. And so I'm going to, to uh, give the floor to o Office of Legal Services Attorney Viana Barbu. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, this, I'm Viana Barbu, attorney with DGS OLS. I'm covering for your usual attorney. Um, she's out of the office today. And I'm going to go over a couple of key updates to Bagley Keen that change how you may um, attend by teleconference mainly. So I'm referring to Senate Bill 544 um, passed last year. And these key rules are effective as of January 1st, 2024. So a little bit of background on the Senate bill, it creates an alternative set of Bagley Keene provisions under which uh, a state body may hold meetings by teleconference, as I mentioned. It also amends portions of the government code, uh, specifically government code section 11123.5, applicable to advisory bodies, which provides an additional optional framework for, for holding meetings by teleconference. Um, these provisions are in effect until January 1st, 2026, at which point there's another set of provisions which will take effect. I'm not going to go over those because that's going to be way too confusing. Uh, we'll go over that in two years from now. So um, also whether these new provisions apply really depends um, on the specific circumstances regarding the individual member in some cases, as you'll see as we go over some of the provisions. Uh, it also depends on the multi-member body and or even a particular scheduled meeting, uh, depending on what kind of actions being taken at that meeting. So any, as uh, the executive director mentioned, any specific questions about how this might affect an individual member or the body or a particular meeting should be addressed um, with them, with her at the, um, um, at the onset of that meeting or before that meeting takes place. So here are some of the key provisions uh, that are uh, have taken effect that apply to all state bodies. And I'll be referring for this part of the section, any kind of mentions of subsections of the law, I'm referring to government code section 11123.2. So now uh, in order to hold uh, meetings by teleconference, a majority of the members must be physically present at the same loca location, which is now being referred to as the teleconference location. So that is the main location where a majority of the members must be physically present. Um, in addition to that, 
Uh, more than one location may be used. However, at least one member of the state body must be physically present at that additional teleconference location. And these are the physical locations. Um, at all these physical locations, the public must be able to attend and participate in the tele, uh, in the at that particular location, and the location must be accessible. In addition to the majority of members that must be physically present at the same location, uh, members in excess of that majority can participate in meetings from remote locations that are not required to be accessible to the public, um, and the agenda and notice do not need to disclose that uh, remote location. Under some conditions, disability accommodations may allow a member to participate remotely and count toward the majority of members. Um, a member attending from a remote location that is not being disclosed um, may uh, count towards the majority if the following conditions are met, then there's two conditions. Either the member has, uh, well, both of these. So the member has a, a need related to a physical or mental disability, as those terms are defined in government code section 12926 and 12926.1 uh, that is not otherwise reasonably accommodated by the ADA. And that member must also notify the state body at the earliest opportunity possible, including at the start of a meeting if that's necessary of their need to participate remotely. Uh, including providing, uh, they must also provide a general description of the circumstances relating to their need to participate remotely at that given meeting. So if this happens, if this occurs and a member um, needs to participate remotely uh, due to a reasonable accommodation, if that member notifies the uh, member notifies the state body of that need to attend and participate remotely, the body shall take action to approve that exception and shall request a general description of the circumstances relating to the member's need to participate remotely at that meeting. So as I mentioned, this will be very would be very specific um, as applicable here to a particular member and their need, and that need could change um, on a meeting to meeting basis. So if anybody has this particular situation happening to them, you should reach out to the executive director as that happens um, to kind of discuss how that will apply to you. Um, in addition to uh, these new requirements, members participating from the remote locations must disclose if other people 18 years of age or older are present in the room and the general nature of the relationship. This is definitely a new requirement. So if you're participating remotely, uh, you must disclose if there's a, an adult present and what the nature of that relationship is to you. During uh, the remote participation for members participating from remote locations that are not in that physical location where a majority are attending, all members must appear on camera during the open portions of the meetings. Um, unless there's a, a technological impracticability or um, like a connectivity issue. If that happens, the member must announce the reason for their non appearance when turning off their camera. And in case you're wondering kind of what the background on this is, it's just because if you are participating remotely under these new rules, um, the general idea of transparency under Bagley Keen still kind of applies. And so we want to know if there's somebody uh, exerting undue influence um, on that member participating remotely or any other um, uh, situation happening in the background that the public should be aware of. Um, in addition, the public must be provided a means to remotely hear audio of the meeting uh, when remotely observing the meeting, and they may, the public must also be able to remotely address the body or attend the meeting by providing on the posted agenda a teleconference telephone number, an internet website, or other online platform, and a physical address for each teleconference location. This is kind of not, not a new requirement, so that it, it's kind of you're probably familiar with this one, but um, it's restated in this code section. Um, so if the public may participate electronically or telephonically, uh, as, as we've stated above, um, the state must also both do both of these things. Implement a procedure for receiving and swiftly resolving requests for reasonable uh, modification or accommodation from individuals with disabilities, and advertise that procedure each time notice is given by means, um, each time the notice is given at the meeting. So um, I believe that this state body already does that. We always provide um, uh, a procedure each time the meeting starts about how people may attend remotely, how they might participate in public comments and others. So this is not really new as either. Uh, in addition, and this also is current, current practice, at each teleconference location, meetings must be audible and visible to the public. 
Uh, and I'm going to switch over just a brief update to um, some new provisions that are applicable only to advisory bodies. And this is government code section 11123.5, which is the new section that was added by this uh, Senate bill. So if a, um, a state body is an advisory body, um, there's new, new requirements now. A primary physical meeting location must be designated in the notice of the meeting where members of the public may be physically uh, present, attend, observe, hear, and participate in the meeting. At least one staff member of the body must be present at the primary physical location during the meeting. And then the advisory body will post the agenda at that primary physical location meeting, uh, but need not post the agenda at a remote location. Any member appearing remotely must be listed in the minutes of the meeting. So that's, that's new. Um, the body needs to provide notice to the public at least 24 hours before the meeting um, that identifies any member who will participate remotely uh, by putting, posting this notice on the internet website and by emailing notice to any person who has requested um, to be notified of uh, notified meetings. Um, the location of the member who will participate remotely is not required to be disclosed in the public notice or email and need not to be accessible to the public. When a member participates remotely, the state body must provide a means by which the public may remotely hear audio of the meeting and remotely observe the meeting. So this is kind of the same similar requirement that applies to the general state body as a whole. Um, advisory members must also visibly appear on camera during the open uh, portion meeting of the meeting. And, um, must be um, must be visible at all times unless there's again like in the other previous section we discussed if there's a technical uh, challenge or internet connectivity issue and in that case the member must state why they're not appearing on camera and so uh, that's kind of it in terms of the updates uh, the main just to kind of summarize uh, the, the main the main difference is that uh, for the general state body that the commission at large you may have uh, a majority present at one physical location, and now you may have others that are in excess of that majority participate remotely without disclosing the location. Um, and, and in terms of advisory bodies only, everybody can participate remotely as long as a staff member is physically present somewhere where the public can attend. Any questions? I know it's very tedious legal language in there but smart give you guys hey, this a full is update. commissioner Con <clears throat> pardon me one moment sorry about that this is commissioner conway um one question i had i just wanted to clarify to make sure i understand and my fellow commissioners know because i believe this is new the mm -hmm. visibly appear on camera requirement for remote attendees yeah um, so i just wanted to flag that to folks since there is there was a lot of info and thank you so much for this training yeah that that's a good point um so now that they're permitting um a larger greater participation remotely um that that concept i mentioned about transparency and public meetings um now it's kind of highlighted by making sure that folks who participate remotely are visible on camera and also that they disclose if there's anybody in the room over 18 and what the nature of that relationship is which was never you know required before i believe there's a question from dr sue Yes, um, thank you again for the information. Um, so I am a person with a disability and today- Can you please I'm, uh, identify yourself? I'm sorry, this is Commissioner Dr. Sue L. Heston. And I am um, a person with a disability. So I'm not on camera now because I'm lying down because of my back pain. So do I need to get on um, visually now? since you stated that? Um, I, I think um, you've explained the reason. Um, so the, the code does allow for, um, for members to, not, to explain why they're not on camera. And so usually it's because of a technical difficulty, but I'm sure that this is, this is proper as long as you've disclosed that. But I would have to disclose it at every meeting if I'm doing this, if I'm in pain. You would just have to say I'm not on camera due to 
whatever the reason is. I get it. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't have to I, be, um, as you know, um, in terms of reasonable accommodations and disabilities, we try not to be very explicit. Um, the law actually says that we shouldn't be disclosing diagnoses and things like that in public. So a generic statement about why you're not visible is sufficient. Okay, but I, I just want to clarify, I would have to do that before every meeting or just let the executive director know? You would have to do that yourself at every meeting. I see. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Any other questions? And Viana, uh, if I may, this is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. I just wanted to share that if any if any member wanted to talk about their particular situation, we have um, we 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 know that we are a are a, a state body that um, has a lot of diverse membership, and so we we have some you know administrative things we're doing to to comply with the law um, and and the intent would not to be cumbersome on the on the members. So just uh, talk to me and I can uh, make sure that you you know what we're doing uh, behind the scenes to comply with the law. Thank you. Yeah, and as these new rules um, become more familiar to everyone, I'm sure there will be procedures that just become routine, um, such as members stating, I'm not on camera for X reason, there's nobody in the room with me that's over 18, that kind of sort of simple generic statement at the beginning of a of a meeting, but it, it's all new now. So we're just still kind of working out the, uh, the, the details. Ms. Commissioner Shapiro, uh, just to clarify, if I understand correctly for purposes of counting a quorum or a majority of the commission present, the people who are appearing remotely at locations that have not been disclosed may participate in the meeting, but do not count toward the the majority or quorum, is that right? Yes, they do not unless they have a reasonable accommodation and that's the reason they're appearing remotely. Does that sufficiently address your question? Yes, thank you. So this is Chair Commissioner Downey. Uh, at this time, I'd like to see if there are any uh, additional questions from members, uh, from commissioners that are joining us virtually on this agenda item. Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. Thank you. Are there any members of the commission that are here in person that would like to address this agenda item? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public that would like to address this uh, agenda item? Members of the public joining us virtually. Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Thank you. Are there any members of the public here in person that would like to address that agenda item? Yeah, this, sorry, Commissioner, this is Commissioner Ramirez. I was trying to turn my mic on. May I make a comment? Okay. Yes, um, I, I did. I was. I was also. I really appreciate some of this new flexibility, particularly given the change in technology and the participation of people with disabilities. Um, and I, I do have a particular concern, particularly around privacy, um, for those individuals that are not able to turn their camera on because of disability. It does create a paper trail or documentation uh, in the public record of having people having to disclose disability for this particular um, accommodation. And having that accumulation of, of public health data um, kind of included in the public record for transparency reasons can be very problematic. Um, and so while I appreciate the intent and definitely uh, support the transparency issue, it is a concerning issue that that type of information becomes accumulated or cured in areas that it was not meant to have, given the fact that some of this documentation, disability, or, or health status um, does have certain identifiable uh, implications in it. And so it, it, it is kind of a red flag um, 
just because it's something that is uh, significantly compromising for those of us that have to disclose it. Um, it could have implications in the workplace, in the community setting, uh, to have to disclose that in public structures, um, even when it's trying to get the public to engage. Uh, so aside from the changes, it's really good, but responsiveness that particular issue does 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 bring up a particular red light, um, red flag of concern. Yeah, unfortunately, the the law, the way it's written, this new government code section one 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 two three point five H, um, kind of only speaks to the reason you wouldn't have your camera on is uh, an, an internet connectivity issue or technological issue. It doesn't take into account other reasons you may not want to have or be able to have your camera on. So unfortunately, the law just isn't thorough enough on dealing with the, the flip side of having to disclose why your camera is off. Um, but I think the commission will look at ways to implement this policy in a way that is, is fair and complies with transparency, but also um, is cognizant of the privacy issues. Thank you. At this time, I believe we made it down to uh, any questions or comments from members of the public that are here in person on this agenda item. Been by commissioners. We'll come back around to commissioners. Okay, I'll open it up. Why? Any questions or comments from anybody on this agenda item, <laughs> virtual or in person? This is uh, Commissioner Holloway. Sorry for popping in late. It just popped in my head um, because our commissioners and our interested members of the public are spread all over California. It might be helpful if um, CCDA staff could take what's been presented today and provide a, a very bullet point summary of the requirements. So you could have the commissioners and the public could have a, a single page that just identified the, the obligations and the requirements of those participating. Um, just in terms of, you know, bullet point summary ideas might be helpful, certainly would be to me. No problem. This is a this is a, I was going to say, Commissioner. This is a Executive Director Dawson Rawlings, and uh, we are planning. We will send a we'll send a follow up a FAQ to everyone. And please reach out to me if you have questions about um, any of the concerns raised today. Thank you. I, as Chair Commissioner Downey, I hear that as a request for a new Commissioner Toolkit. So thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, it. Any further questions, comments? Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. I do have a question. When does the guideline effective date? When is it going to? Uh, this these uh, this new law is effective January first, twenty twenty four. It's already been in effect uh, the last almost three months. Thank you. So it's in effect now. Uh, yes, Commissioner Shapiro. I have one other question. Uh, do I understand correctly to address something like uh, Commissioner Ramirez's concern and because of the unique makeup of our commission that in order to get something changed that would require legislation? Is that right? In terms of um, not disclosing pri private matters or in what sense do you mean? Either in, in terms of uh, being able to indicate that a a member of the commission cannot be on camera without having to disclose um, particular details with respect to that. Would Is that something that can be done by regulation or is that something that would be required to be done by legislation? Um, well, it, the, the lawyerly answer is it depends. Um, the, the, uh, the statute already kind of has a little bit of flexibility in it as to, it kind of gives an example of why you might not be on camera. And I think it could be expanded to, to include other reasons that are a little bit more generic and less uh, kind of focused on being private, um, focusing on privacy. So um, I believe that the commission staff will look at ways to kind of implement the policy that will give you something you you may say um, that kind of 
explains why you're not on camera without disclosing any private details or minimal private details. So um, I don't think it re requires um, legislative change as much as getting used to this new, these new policies and kind of coming up with, um, with a way to meet the law without disclosing private um, issues. Thank you. This is Chair Commissioner Downey, and that uh, once we sort that out, when staff sorts that out, it'd be great to include that on our new commissioner of Bagley Clean Toolkit. Okay. Um, I just a quick reminder in conjunction with the uh, lack of camera use um, is also disclosure if there's somebody 18 or over in the room and what their relationship may be. So I think that is maybe a bigger component of the transparency uh, part of this law. Um, so as long as that is addressed, um, I think that's that can be kind of the transparency issue a little bit more of a concern is your camera is off and is there somebody in the room with you that's influencing you to vote a certain way or to say certain things. So as long as you're addressing the, the adult in the room and what the nature of their relationship is, um, you may be able to be a little bit more vague as to why the reason your camera is off in light of the privacy issue. This is Chair Commissioner Downey. I think, again, we'll need some guidance from staff or others uh, in regards to uh, if we have caregivers uh, present, which then starts to run into some of the same issues. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, we can, unless you have something else to, to add, we can uh, have staff advise us on that. Yeah, thank thank you. I I don't I don't mean to sound like a broken record. This is a this is a Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. I know that I'm I know that I'm being I'm being intentionally vague, but I'm uh, I want to because I don't want to get into any um, specific privacy issues in this meeting. But I do want to share that um, Executive Leadership of CCDA has has you know chatted with legal, and we we do have procedures in place that that will, you know, uphold these, these rules as well as, you know, respect the dignity of every person who is a part of this commission. So please reach out to me about these issues and I can tell you what our, our game plan is to address these that are in compliance with the law. Thank you. Thank you. This is Chair Commissioner Downey. And I, to the extent we're trying to sort it out here, it, members of uh, you know, people with disabilities, uh, can attend all sorts of other commission hearings uh, for, for the state. It might be important to uh, share share this uh, language up the stream because uh, it's it's an important thing for any member of the public with a disability to participate in any other commission hearing. So it's relevant. So thank you. Are there any other questions or comments regarding this agenda item? Again, keeping it open to any public uh, commissioners present or virtual. Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication uh, in person or virtual. Thank you. So with that, uh, uh, based on our earlier action, it's time to hop over item five to item six. Uh, concerning our accessible parking campaign, the APC for that. Again, I'll turn that over to uh, our executive director, April Dawson Rawlings. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is executive director, April Dawson Rawlings. And I am excited to uh, be talking to all of you about our accessible parking toolkits that we have before you today. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a background, particularly for new voices in the room, new commissioners and public. Uh, who uh, may be new to this project and share a little bit about uh, where where we where, how far we've come and and what we're hoping for uh, for the future with this project. So as as many of you know, one of our key uh, statutory obligations is to provide technical assistance to our stakeholders to ensure that businesses are accessible to people with disabilities. And we also track alleged disability access uh, violations for construction and now websites. Um, in our legal portal, and we utilize that data to determine uh, programming. And so one of the trends that we noticed, as well as members of the legislature noticed from our annual report findings, was that accessible parking uh, 
uh, and um, issues with exterior paths of travel and um, also the conversation around website accessibility for businesses uh, became um, an issue that kept trending on our data. And so an assembly member, assembly member Fong uh, introduced a bill, AB, not, AB 2917, uh, that asked the CCDA that to create a toolkit to address um, accessible parking and include elements related to ex exterior passive travel, as well as to begin tracking alleged disability access violations related to websites and to, and to partner with uh, the Department of Rehabilitation, uh, the Division of the State Architect and others to be able to, um, to create educational materials to address that. We'll be talking about the website component later. Uh, right now we're talking about the toolkits. And so uh, almost two years ago, a little the better part of 18 months to two years ago, uh, we convened a work group, first one work group that talked about how we were going to address uh, this toolkit. And it was a, a few months after that, it was really determined that the business owner community and the construction industry had some unique needs. And so uh, because of the, the hard work of stakeholders and these stakeholders came from you know, the, 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 the developer industry, uh, construction managers, architects, people with disabilities, uh, ADA coordinators, small business owners, among others, uh, got together and uh, decided that there should be two work groups. And so the two group work groups met regularly uh, to create content uh, and move through uh, both the internal and external process of uh, over the, the better part of over a year to create this content. And uh, we also uh, worked uh, at various points in the process with the with the division of the state architect with uh, the real estate services division at DSA and their their internal uh, CASP and architect staff, as well as uh, CALBO, uh, which works with building building officials and the um, the CSLB, which is the contractor state license board. And uh, we, where we have come to today is um, in your in your packets, we have the the final drafts of the the toolkits that we would like to present for a vote of approval. And uh, we're really excited to be able to um, move to the outreach phase of the accessible parking campaign that we launched. And what that would entail is, is that uh, once the commission approves the two, two, two toolkits, we will uh, work through our subcommittees, the education and outreach committee, as well as the checklist committee and, of, and, and the full commission to talk about ways that we can best effectively uh, reach this information to our stakeholders. And we will be working with our original stakeholder groups to help us do that since it was such a diverse group. And we're also going to be using our social media uh, to, to get the word out. And we also have, have also thought of creative ideas around, you know, taking some of the pages of the toolkit and creating, you know, one pagers out of it or modules. Um, and I'm going to talk later in this meeting and other portions about some of the more outreach that we would like to do. Uh, but that is uh, what we are planning for this project. And uh, I welcome any questions or comments about uh, the, tool to, the two toolkits that you have before you today. This is Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Um, are these going to be coming out in different languages, like Spanish or? Yes, that's a that's a great question. This is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. We we will translate these toolkits into uh, the at least the top twelve threshold languages from the state of California. And in addition, we're also planning on utilizing these toolkits when we go to our listening forums. Uh, I'll share a little bit more later about what our listening forums are looking like this year and next year, um, but we also are going, are going to be anchoring a lot of content and uh, of our listening forums utilizing these toolkits, and we're going to translate those in the, into the languages that are spoken uh, by the, 
the threshold languages in the communities where we're hosting the listening forums as well. So they'll be available. Some of them will be pre will be printing them in in English and uh, Spanish and Mandarin, and then we'll also um, be uh, having them available in other languages as well um, as PDFs, and we can also print and distribute them to different different communities. So we're making sure we're paying attention using census data in the communities we're reaching out to to look at who the what the threshold languages are so that we're, and we're doing, going to be doing that for, for all of our materials. And I'll be sharing that a little bit later in the meeting when we talk about a little bit more about equity, but to answer your question, yes, we're translating it in different languages. Thank you. I have another question. This is uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Um, what does the distribution strategies look like? Is this gonna be something that they get through public health, city hall? What, what does that look like? That's a great question. This is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. We have talked with, um, for the construction toolkit in particular, we are planning to distribute it with uh, the CSLB, with the Contractor State License Board, and they are planning to uh, use it toward their education of, of, of contractors. And we've also had conversations with some of the other uh, members of our, our outreach, or excuse me, our, our, uh, our toolkit uh, groups. And our plan is to, upon approval, share these out and have strategic meetings with each of the groups to talk about how best to get them out to their partners. Um, but early conversations have been that the CSLB is, is looking forward to helping us distribute them to their members. And um, we'd also really like to make sure that we're listening during, during our next education and outreach committee meeting in April. Uh, we'll be talking uh, on the agenda about how to get the, uh, the toolkits out there effectively. So if you have ideas, uh, please share them with us. And, um, but those are the initial, initial ideas to get them out is to translate them into different languages and to work directly with our partners to help us develop the toolkits and the trade organizations. Also the California Business Properties Association and others um, have talked to us about helping distribute them to our members. And we've thought about ideas for, you know, developing, developing smaller modules in the future related to some of the content uh, that we could put on our web, our website and social media. Uh, things that can be easily shared out. So those are some of the ideas that we've that we've generated so far that we'll start to implement. This is Commissioner Drake Dillard. I am hoping that uh, it's been a while since we actually seen the document. I was hoping that the subcommittee would have the opportunity to meet one more time uh, to review this. I know Bill's is at the meeting online. But there's other individuals I'm hoping we could just have another meeting to uh, kind of review it before it's final. Thank you for your feedback. Okay. This is Chair Commissioner Downey. Are there any other comments from members of the commission that are joining us virtually? Uh, yes, this is Commissioner Al Hessen. Um, and I also chair the um, Education Outreach Committee. So I was wondering, um, but I guess I kind of answered my own question we'll be discussing, but I wanted to be sure that we're looking at the city's um, building and safety, that everyone's on the same page in regards to supporting businesses. So, I, but I guess we'll be discussing this during our um, meeting in April. Thank you. This is Commissioner Shapiro. I have a apologies for the rather silly question. Perhaps there, each of these has a credits page, and I was wondering if this is inclusive of everyone who's participated since the inception of the project, or if this is uh, supposed to be a, a more up to date list. Uh, there's a number of older names there's uh, on it. So just so that I have an understanding, what was the intent of the scope of the page, please? Thank you, Commissioner Sapiro. This is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. Traditionally, when we've produced technical documents, when we do the credits page, we use the 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 roster of the commission commissioners that um, worked from the on the when the project was in its inception. 
And since the majority of the work was done from the, the old roster, we that's traditionally how we've uh, how we've uh, approached the, that, those pages in our other documents. So we kept that the same for this document. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Downey, are there any other comments from members of the commission joining us virtually? Chair, Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Thank you. Are there any uh, comments from members of the commission here in person? This is Commissioner Shapiro. I want to uh, express my uh, appreciation and admiration for the work of the committee in producing these drafts. These documents are incredible, and I am uh, so very grateful to all of the hard work by the subcommittee uh, and the members of the commission, the um, legislators and the staff members on producing these documents. They, they are truly amazing. Thank you, Commissioner Shapiro. Thank you. Uh, I too would like to uh, echo that. Uh, it's greatly appreciated and especially all the hard work for members of the subcommittee and members of the staff. Uh, it's a very important document that's really addressing a, a significant need as identified by our legal porter, portal for uh, uh, the, the top 10 um, most frequently uh, cited violations. So um, that's a, it's a very uh, important uh, service to the state. So thanks to all the commissioner, commissioners who worked on this and, and uh, members of the subcommittee. So thanks for everybody's hard work on that and tenacity and patience to see it through. Um, thank you. Any other comments from commissioners joining us virtually or in uh, in person? Okay. This is Commissioner. Sure, commissioner. Oh. I also want to just uh, thank uh, for the opportunity to have been able to work on this, but definitely all of our staff who support us uh, to this. You know, it, it's really all this is my and your leadership kind of like leading this. I really want to thank all of you. I believe there was someone else that wished to address this item. Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so I'm sure it was, uh, I see, are there any members of the public that would like to address this item for joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, we do have two public members. Uh, first with their hand raised, we have Mike Jeminski. Good. Good morning, members of the commission. My name is Mike Jeminski, Deputy Registrar, calling from the Contractor State License Board. CSLB staff thanks the commission and its staff for the opportunity to contribute to the Construction Industry Educational Toolkit for the CCDA Accessible Parking Campaign. Uh, with that, thank you everyone for your time and back to you, moderator. Thank you, and thank you for your service uh, with this commission for this uh, toolkit. Thank you. Chair Commissioner Downey, we do have Bill Zelmer with his hand raised in the public member. Hi, uh, you're recognized, Bill, Mr. Zimmer. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Bill Zelmer with Sutter Health. Uh, so I helped on the um, the business owners and operators guide for accessible parking. I just wanted to express, I think this came out great on the other end, um, but it's tough to hit that right balance between providing not enough information and too much information. Uh, I fear that some people will pick up the guide and they will be a little overwhelmed because it's a lot of detailed stuff. And unless you live in the world of accessibility compliance, it will all be unfamiliar territory. So we tried to do a, a decent job of getting it narrowed down to the most important elements that wouldn't be too confusing. 
Um, and I think I think it came out well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zimmer, and thank you again for your efforts uh, with this subcommittee on this toolkit. Are there any other questions or comments uh, from members of the public that are uh, here virtually, joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay. How about any members of the public that are here in person that would like to address this item? Okay. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to request a motion uh, to approve uh, granting opportunity of a final review by the uh, subcommittee uh, on this item. So could I have uh, a motion to approve? This is Commissioner Ramirez. I got motion to approve. Thank this you. Can I have a second? Second. Sure. second. Thank you. Was a second by uh, Commissioner Luciana Profaccia. So thank you. Uh, with that, uh, it's uh, time for a roll call vote. Presley, off to you. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I will start the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Downey? Aye. Commissioner Dillard? Aye. Commis thank you. <laughs> Commissioner El Hessen? Aye. Commissioner Holloway? Aye. Commissioner Jackson? Aye. Commissioner Leon Vasquez? Aye. Commissioner Lillibridge? Commissioner Profasa? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Commissioner Shapiro? Mm. All right, Chair Commissioner Downey, all CCDA commissioner votes have been noted. I will pass it back to you. Thank you. This is Chair Commissioner Downey, and thanks again to staff and all the subcommittee members who worked on this. Thank you very much for all your hard work on this important topic. So with that, uh, it's time for us to continue along our uh, uh, previously approved did the hopscotch. Off to item five, <laughs> back to item five, a tribute uh, to uh, our um, to Betty Wilson. Uh, has our guest uh, ar arrived virtually? Uh, Chair Commissioner Downey, this is Executive Director Dawson, uh, excuse me, Dawson Rawlings. <laughs> and um, I, I will start. I have a, let the person who is coming uh, know that, that we are ready for her, and but I will kick this off. Um, I also wanted to, to hold space that um, our, uh, our, D, our Department of Rehabilitation guest has a hard stop at noon. I apologize. We went a, a, a little over more than I, I thought we would on the previous topic. And so um, if we, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will defer to you to see if we could uh, move switch items to seven and eight after we finish uh, talking about this. But um, but but first, I'd like to hold space for for Commissioner Betty Wilson. Uh, I want to share some some words and then invite the, the commissioners and the public to to share their memories of Betty. Uh, former Commissioner Betty Wilson uh, was a passionate advocate for civil rights, program access, and cultural diversity. Uh, throughout her career, she was committed to inclusivity and equality, and she left an impact on the realms of disability rights and the development of inclusionary policies. She was she achieved a historic milestone by establishing the inaugural Department on Disability for a Municipal Government. And this was a groundbreaking move that led to the foundation for the propagation of federal and state laws, as well as local mandates pertaining to civil rights with a specific emphasis on disability issues and policies. In addition to being one of the first members of CCDA, she also was a member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. And she played a pivotal role in shaping policies and recommending, making recommendations to, to the state legislature. She was the chair of the CCDA's Education and Outreach Committee, 
uh, which exemplified her commitment to providing comprehensive training and education on access compliance. In addition to that, she represented the city of LA at international conferences. She also provided technical assistance and training for city departments and the private sector. And because of her efforts, there is a more inclusive and diverse environment in those places where she touched. We also want to share that Commissioner Wilson participated in international conferences and cons was a consultant. Uh, she also received the United Nations Distinguished Service Award uh, Medallion of Excellence, which was her, which was a testament to her contributions uh, in providing equal rights to persons with disabilities. And she also did quite a bit of international work on behalf of people with disabilities. And I, even though I did not get a chance, this is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings speaking, I did not get a chance to know Commissioner Wilson personally. I have been in it, we have been inundated at the commission with, with words of praise for her and the lives that she, the lives that she touched. And um, we have, I, I, because of the fact that I didn't get a chance to get to know her personally, I wanted to invite former executive director, Angela Jamat, um, and she just texted me that she's logging in now, um, who wanted to share some words of, of praise for uh, former commissioner, Betty Wilson as all, as well. And so uh, if staff could let me know when Angela is logged in, we'll, we'll uh, have her speak, but she's logging in right now. But just on behalf of the California Commission on Disability Access, we just want to honor Betty and thank her for her years of service to us and to everyone in California, because when you help people with disabilities, you're really helping everyone in California. Um, you're you're creating a better world for everyone when you center access and she she's an example of how like one life can touch so many different facets of society just by showing up authentically and fighting for your your right to be in the community. So. Presley is has Angela logged in yet. Hi, April. This is Presley. She is not logged in yet, but I am keeping an eye out and I will let you know as soon as she does. Well, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. Uh, I'll fill in the gaps here a little bit uh, and just express uh, my own sort of uh, fondness for uh, uh, Betty Wilson and the honor I had of really feel like I was welcomed to this commission way back when through through Betty Wilson uh, and and through her, through our our uh, uh, conversations, our work together on the exec, uh, outreach and uh, um, education committee really developed a, a strong bond and work uh, working relationship uh, through which, as a new member of the disability community, really learned so much and got so much depth uh, through uh, all these conversations with her. So it's it's been a, a real pleasure to have had the the opportunity to meet. Uh, and get to know Betty Wilson by virtue of being on this commission and her her uh, uh, early participation, her uh, really sort of cast the mold for what we do here and the passion um, that she brought to it. So I do my best to sort of carry that on, carry on in that tradition and bring her passion and zest for for this uh, and and pulling the state together through disability access. And uh, Chair Commissioner Downey, uh, former Executive Director Angela Jamont is here. So uh, I would invite Angela to join me in uh, co-presenting this, this tribute to Betty. If you'd like to say a few words, Angela. Yes, uh, thank you so very much for this opportunity, uh, Director uh, and Chair. I, I am I'm honored to be able to come and join you all today in tribute to an amazing woman. Uh, I did have the opportunity to participate in her home going um, in Los Angeles and and there it it brought floods of thoughts of her excellence as it does today for me. Um, indeed, uh, as she was a founder of um, the board, the California Commission on Disability Access, her mark was felt by all. She had a determination that was, um, I would say, equal to none. Uh, she 
had a vision of what she wanted to see happen for this community. And she had a passion that ignited me to believe in what we had being birthed through the years of coming together. And I just know that um, for, for me, I have been forever changed. And I, I would hope others have as well. Um, she brought insight that no one else in my life has brought to me and I'm forever grateful. She was the chair of the education committee for a number of years, but she was influential in every aspect of the board, education, legislation, uh, the various tools and products that were being created. Um, she was a part of everything. And so with that, I'm, I, I truly took time out, ran out of another meeting because I had to be here to celebrate Commissioner Wilson. She has forever marked CCDA and as well as myself. I thank you all for this opportunity to share my thoughts. Um, I will just lastly say that there are people who has uh, come and gone uh, from this earth <laughs> and in our personal lives and our professional lives that we don't even remember their name. But I will tell you, I believe that she is a name that many will never forget and the personality that will mark everyone forever. And I'm just, again, grateful that for this opportunity to share my thoughts and tributes to her great work and service to the state of California and to the nation. And actually internationally, she has, uh, I don't know if you had uh, written there about her international work, but she actually was quite influential in not only in California, but throughout the nation and internationally. And so again, I give homage to her and her legacy that she's left with all of us at CCDA. And thank you for this time. Thank you, as Chair Commissioner Downing. Thank you, uh, former uh, Executive Director Angela Jamat. I guess in, in summary, I'd say, as goes Betty, so goes the commission, so goes the state, so goes the nation and the world. So I really appreciate all the uh, tireless work she put into it. And and uh, also uh, that she touched people the way she did, that she would you know, uh, prompt this opportunity for Angela to come back and speak to us. So thank you for that. Thank you, April, for your words on regarding Betty. And uh, at this time, I'd like to open it up to members of the commission if they would like to uh, say something in, in tribute to, to Betty Wilson, former uh, Commissioner Betty Wilson. Um, this is Commissioner O. Hessen. And I'd just like to say that when I served on the Silk, I had the opportunity to meet her. Um, that was back in 2007, I think, 2000, during 2010. And what I most found remarkable is, is her passion and her um, devotion to truly and um, working on inclusion for people with disabilities. And as a disability leader myself, and all of, I'm sure all of my commissioners can attest to is that we stand on the shoulders of those who um, came before us. And I feel that way in regards to Betty Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from members of the commission joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Any comments from members of the commission here in person? This is Commissioner Dr. Luciana Prefazza, and I had an opportunity over the decades to have meetings and be in the presence of Betty Wilson many, many times and was always impressed and grateful for her passion and her knowledge and her commitment to the disability community. And uh, she was truly a powerhouse in every single meeting and had a great um, contribution every single time. So I honor her and uh, appreciate her service. 
this is Commissioner Holloway. I just want to say that um, I was honored to serve with her. Um, she was uh, just gracious and committed. And I'd like to uh, exemplify everything that the other commissioners and uh, former director uh, Jamad have said. Um, she was uh, an incredible commissioner. She did a great job here at CCDA. And she has, leaves a big seat to be filled. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from members of the commission? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay. And I don't believe or have as any member of the public joined us here in person. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, uh, uh, Executive Director uh, April Dawson Rawlings and former Director, Executive Director Angela Jamont for uh, uh, addressing this item. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't recall where we, was there an issue with item seven? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is uh, Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. Uh, the next agenda item is, is uh, agenda item seven. However, uh, the person who is presenting for gen agenda item eight has a hard stop at noon. Uh, so we would request that we switch those. Thank right. you. Thank you. So for that, I presume we'll need to have another uh, roll call vote, vote for a, a, a deviation from the printed agenda. That being the case, uh, I could have a motion to approve uh, that uh, vote to alter the order of the agenda. So moved. Eight ahead of seven. Excuse me. Commissioner Lohessen, so moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Commissioner Shapiro, second. Thank you. Uh, so, Presley, you're up again for a roll call vote. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I will start it off. Commissioner Downey? Aye. Commissioner Dillard? Aye. Commissioner Lesson? Aye. Commissioner Holloway? Aye. Commissioner Jackson? Commissioner Jackson? He's saying aye. She, it's it's the microphone. For sure. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez? Commissioner Lillibridge, Commissioner Profasa, aye. Commissioner Ramirez, aye. Commissioner Shapiro, aye. Chair Commissioner Downey, all CCDA commissioner votes have been noted, and the motion carries. I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Presley. With that, we'll move on to agenda item eight. Uh, presentation by the Department of Rehabilitation um, concerning website accessibility. And I'll turn it over to our Executive Director, April Dawson Rawlings, uh, for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I'm excited to announce that uh, Jake Johnson, the Deputy Director of the Information Technology Services Division and the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Rehabilitation is here to uh, present his topic. And I will ask uh, Operations Manager Phil McFall to read. Um, we'll, we'll do the respectable yet abridged version of your biography because it's very um, esteemed uh, in the interest of time. And then we will uh, love to hear from you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings. Um, this is Phil McFall, Operations Manager here at California Commission Disability Access. I want to talk to you today about uh, Jake Johnson. Jake Johnson is a deputy director of Information Technology Sur Services, excuse me, division and chief information officer at the Department of Rehabilitation. He is a member of the DOR's executive leadership team. He serves as voice for assistive technology, accessibility, employ accessibility employment, and independence in the information technology arena, including with Cal HHS agency, 
California Department of Technology, Department of Finance, CIO peers, information technology providers, and information technology stakeholders throughout state government. I'm going to come off of the stand because it's not working for me. <laughs> um, um, he provides executive oversight to DOR's ITSD, leading approximately 65 managers and staff who provide support in database administration and applications development, project management and administration, software quality assurance, web services, technical support services, and assistive technology, assistive technology field support, infrastructure services, and information security and privacy. Mr. Johnson has been legally blind since birth and is, for, is a former DOR consumer. He has been with DOR since 2012 and most recently serving in an acting role as deputy director and CIO since July of 2022. Prior to his current role, he was the customer service and administra administration branch chief in ITSD. Previous roles at DOR include managing the applications development, software quality assurance, web services, and accessible technology functions. Before joining DOR, Mr. Johnson worked for Franchise Tax Board as an information security specialist and for the Department of Finance as Enterprise Budget Systems technical lead. He has a bachelor's degree in English with a minor in linguistics, a master's degree in education, and is a certified information systems security professional. He is a graduate of the California IT Leadership Academy and Sierra Health Foundation Leadership Program. He has served as president of the Association of California State Employees with Disabilities and remains active in the state's civil rights community as a member of the ACSED and the Asian Pacific State Employees Association. And I will turn it over to you, Mr. Jake Johnson. Thank you so much. Um, I need to cut that down. It's a long bio. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for having me here today. Thank you to uh, Executive Director uh, Dawson Rawlings and to the uh, Commission for, for, um, for just letting me be part of the conversation today. Uh, very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Um, I just want to start out and I'm going to um, kind of try to abbreviate my presentation a little bit. Uh, probably will be a good thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I just want to start out by saying we're really talking about uh, more and more uh, digital equity, um, uh, which is kind of a, a larger topic that includes web accessibility. Uh, there's just more to it, and we're we're recognizing that. Um, and if we sort of start think, if we start thinking from the perspective of uh, really seeing um, accessibility and digital equity from the perspective of the people we serve. And I'm gonna tell you um, what we think digital equity is and how we, how we, um, how we uh, look at digital equity in a moment. But before I go there, I would just like to say that um, we know we have about a quarter of the population nationwide uh, within the US, and this is a CDC number from last year, about one in four uh, Americans uh, have uh, some kind of disability, right? That could impact their ability to, um, to obtain government services. <clears throat> so we also know that about 51% of US adults uh, prefer to access government services online. <clears throat> and that's actually a Brookings Institute number from 2019. I wasn't able to find anything newer than that, unfortunately, but that number has been hanging around 50% for the last maybe 15, 16 years. So we know it's it's gone up a bit. Uh, there's, I think, reason to believe that it's gone up since 2019. We've had some uh, significant events that have um, got us all better at doing things online over the past few years. So, uh, so we, the number is likely to have gone up, even though we don't have that documented here. Um, so, so we know that the people we serve, uh, many of them have uh, some kind of disability, and we know that they also are looking to uh, obtain services from us online. Um, so with those two uh, pieces of information and that coming in with that understanding, we start to think about what it means to provide equitable services online. What does it mean? Um, 
to have digital equity. And it's it's fairly straightforward, honestly. Um, we have to make sure that everyone has access to the information and services they need. Uh, and that means everyone. We can't leave anyone behind. We can't marginalize anyone. Um, we need to make sure that everyone is able to fully participate um, and that it doesn't require extra effort on their part. So it, it isn't fair to say, well, you have to, um, uh, someone else can do this in uh, a couple of minutes, but it, it takes you a half an hour. Um, so uh, so that, that, and that's just the way it works, right? We can't do that. And, and I don't think that that's ever done intentionally, um, but we need to watch out for it because um, uh, uh, as we're looking at these ways to provide service, we need to make sure that, they, that they're comparable in terms of the access people have to them. Uh, value for everyone has to be comparable. So if, if we have someone who is deaf and who is watching a video and not able to, uh, to hear the, the content, they still have to be able to come away with the same level and quality of information as someone who hears it, right? So they're going to um, be uh, seeing the captions for the video. Um, so, and, and it just has to be, um, from a qualitative perspective, it has to be the same experience. It doesn't have to be delivered in the same way, but it has to they have to have the same result when they're coming away from that experience. So, um, so how do we get there? What, what is it? Let's talk about kind of what, what we do to create that equity um, because it doesn't happen by accident. So um, at Department of Rehabilitation, we, um, we subscribe to a, a philosophy or a, a design uh, approach that called universal design. And, and we could spend hours uh, talking about that, that's a, it's a huge topic, but I'm just going to boil it down to the, the main piece, which is the goal of universal design is to, to uh, ensure full accessibility and usability by everyone built in from the inception, right? So that, what that means for us is we, whenever we start any kind of new uh, effort to develop a service or enhance a service or um, create a new product or even procure something new, we always start from a position of saying, okay, we need to make sure that it's usable by everyone, that we plan that in from the start. It's not something that we sort of do along the way or try to do it after the fact. Um, we build it in from the start. So that's universal design. Um, when we start thinking about information accessibility, and, and my apologies if this is review for anyone, it just helps, for us, it helps to kind of boil down what accessibility is in kind of business terms um, so that we all know what we're talking about. When we say we need to make something accessible, um, there's really two kind of significant um, components to making uh, a product or service accessible. Um, so you know, on one side, we have the content, the creative content, right? So that would be the electronic documents, the web pages, the video, the audio, all of that needs to be usable by everyone. And we would take different approaches for different populations to ensure that it's usable, right? And, and, and also when we're talking about digital equity, um, we also can add in um, language access uh, is another one. We might be um, uh, designing for uh, um, text that isn't overly technical and full of jargon, right? We wanna make it simpler to understand. So there are other pieces that can fit in that might not necessarily be considered um, accessibility from a sort of a classic perspective where we're trying to make it usable by assistive technology users. Um, but we wanna make the content accessible, right? So we're going to have to do certain things to make that happen. There are technical considerations that I won't uh, discuss here, but just let's um, just accept that there are ways to make the, all of this type of content accessible. I, mean, I guess a couple, couple of examples might be, as I mentioned earlier, those uh, video captions that allow deaf and hard of hearing users to uh, watch video. There may be uh, um, audio descriptions, of, uh, there may be audio descriptions of, of that same video for a blind user so that they can, uh, they can understand what's happening, what's visually happening without seeing it. Uh, of course, document accessibility for blind users might include structuring it in a way that 
their assistive technology products, a screen reader is able to uh, let them consume the content. So that's kind of the first part, it's just making the digital content usable. And, and that's going to include the content delivery system too. So the websites, the, the systems, um, they all have to be uh, designed for the content to be uh, made accessible as well. The second piece is going to be the hardware and software that the user is working with. So the iPhone or the Samsung Galaxy or the PC or the iPad or whatever they're using to get to the content, that um, that has to be, uh, uh, that has to support accessibility as well. So, um, and more and more we're seeing uh, universal design being employed to develop these kinds of devices. So they just come out of the box, right? You can, if you're, uh, depending on what your need is, you may be able to, in, in most instances, just pull the device out of the box and enable the features that you need uh, the, the assistive technology features you need and, and, and you're, you're able to start using it with that accessible content. That's equity, right? That's universal design. Um, it's, I think, useful to sort of point out at this point, because we start, we're going to start to get into uh, 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 how do we do it? How do we get there? And we're going to talk about, um, you know, some more of the benefits and, and what have you. Uh, before we do that, I think it's worthwhile to sort of um, just highlight that although um, um, a lot of the requirements that we're looking at here are required by various statutes and policies and, and standards, and, and uh, there is, it's seen as we often can see accessibility and, and, and equity as compliance requirements, right? Um, I would implore you to also think about the fact that the reason why these requirements exist is because we as a society have said equity and accessibility are important to us. We get these things done because we want them to be done as a, as a society. Uh, some people may feel it as compliance, but really uh, we, our intent is to shift the culture to one where, uh, where we can just uh, have everyone have, should be able to have the expectation that they can just use anything they need to use, right? Um, I won't go too far into uh, sort of my examples here. But I will just mention one quick one. Um, so last year, I, uh, I purchased a couple of new iPhones for my wife and me. Um, we both had our phones for around eight years. So we decided that it was time for us to get new ones. And when, uh, when we got them, uh, we purchased them online. We received them in the mail. Uh, I set them up for both of us. So if I set mine up first, right? Because I want to make sure I do it the right way and that I, whatever kinks or bugs I run into, I can deal with them on my, my phone and not have to do it with hers. So I set mine up, turned on the accessibility features I needed. Uh, I'm a screen magnification user. So I was able to turn that on very quickly, went to the manual for the, uh, for the phone and found out how to do it. Again, I actually already knew how to do it, but I just looked in the manual because I wanted to make sure that they had it in there, right? And, and uh, just wanted to be aware of, of the fact that uh, they, they put it in the manual, the regular manual that everybody gets. It wasn't a special manual for assistive technology users or blind people. It was, it was the same manual that anyone would read. Um, turned on the features I needed, set up the phone, took me like 15 minutes to do it took my wife's phone out of the box, turned on the magnification, set her phone up, got it going another 15 minutes, turned the magnification off and gave it to her. And we were, we were ready to go and we didn't have to do anything special, right? That to me was, was equity. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's really, and that's because our society wants it that way. And that's because Apple views it as a business advantage for them to serve everyone. So, uh, so okay, so we do have laws and policy and, and, and uh, standards around accessibility. And just wanna kind of say that, so at the, at the federal level, we have section 508 and, and the ADA uh, title II. Um, so, and, and then we have the, of course, the Rehabilitation Act at the state level. We have, uh, we have various statutes at the state level, government code 7405, uh, as an example, 
uh, government code uh, uh, 11135. Uh, we have um, actually probably the best thing, if you ever wanna look at a technical document that gets it right, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.0 is just fantastic for the way it ensures that we require accessibility, but doesn't get too involved in all the details. It's really looking for the outcomes that we get from the systems. So uh, very good. Uh, I'll mention, and I'll actually put it in the chat in a few moments, the, um, the, the actually, why don't I just do it now so I don't forget. I'm gonna put in, so this one I'm putting in the chat is a link to our web accessibility toolkit from DOR that we, oops, looks like I sent it as a direct message to, uh, I didn't send it to everyone. Excuse me for one moment. I'm putting it in the chat for all of you. Um, so this is our, uh, our um, website that it, it contains all the accessibility resources that we know about that are good resources, laws and statutes, uh, policy, uh, the technical requirements, explanations about what accessibility is. Um, we actually convene a quarterly uh, forum or web accessibility community of practice where we pull together uh, various uh, practitioners around the state that work on web accessibility. Uh, so we have, we have a lot of resources that you can uh, gain access to and, and hopefully benefit from. Uh, we also offer classes on document accessibility training uh, through CalHR, our um, disability access services um, team offers a training on uh, um, document accessibility. So like Word documents and Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint uh, presentations, PDF documents. So we have some of these resources, uh, lots of ways to get plugged into them. Um, and I just want to kind of mention, um, just before I, I open it up to questions, because we have maybe about 10 minutes left, I just want to say that um, at the point that we're in now, really, the, there, there are still a few barriers. We've gotten so much better at accessibility. Um, I think the biggest ones right now are really um, about the populations we serve. If, if someone can get to us, in most cases, they're gonna they're gonna get to accessible content, right? But getting to us is still hard for a lot of folks, right? They may not be able to afford the technology. Um, they may just not have the right technology solution, right? They because you know, in mo in many instances it just comes out of the box. But there are cases where you still have to do a little bit of work to get things turned on and to to work with them. I think the biggest one that we still see. And the one that most keeps that, that keeps me up at night, uh, frankly, is around people learning how to use this technology. Um, I always uh, kind of like to joke that uh, using assistive technology is like reading a book while you're riding a bicycle. Um, not something I would recommend, but for accessible technology, we have to we have to learn to use it, right? Even though it's very challenging. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there. It seems like just from the the information we've gathered at the at the state level, there have been surveys that we've conducted for our digital equity planning efforts, and we found that there are a lot of people that just don't use it, right? They just maybe they don't know how to, or maybe they just don't don't recognize that they need it. Um, that's what keeps us up at night right now, and so uh, uh, I think that really as a uh, as a state. Um, we really just need to make sure that we keep keep trying to figure it out, keep working with those people. I never thought I would say it, but it does feel like sometimes accessibility was sort of the easy part. We just have to make sure that we keep doing the good work that we've been doing and keep expanding it and keep teaching new people how to do it. And, and that that feels a little easier than the than the digital equity part where we're trying to help people that aren't able to get to us. I mean, maybe they live in a rural area. I think there's a lot of that too, right? Where it's like, if, if they could get to the network and they could get to our website, they would be fine. But, you know, if, if you're living out in a uh, an isolated area, you know, my brother-in-law has a place that's pretty rural and I can get phone reception at his house if I stand in the exact right place on his property and hold my phone just right. But um, it's a barrier for a lot of folks. So we, we have a lot of work to do, um, but we also need to recognize the good ground that we've covered. And uh, with that, I will uh, 
turn it back over to the team uh, and answer any questions if folks have them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. This is Chris, uh, Chair Commissioner Downey. Uh, are there any comments from uh, members of the commission joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication virtually for commissioners. Any comments from commissioners here in person on this agenda item? This is Commissioner Luciana Prefazza. And Jake, I'm just so um, thrilled to hear the continuing work of the Department of Rehabilitation as the prime leader in ensuring accessibility. I had been the chief deputy director of the department and I see the, that the, um, the strength and the knowledge of our department continues through the following decades since I've left. And I just want to really acknowledge you and the department for your leadership and uh, appreciate so much the presentation that you made today. I would ask if you'd please send my warm regards to Joe Xavier and the entire team. Yes, ma'am, I certainly will. And thank you for the kind words. We're, we're, we're keeping moving it forward. Um, and, and thank you for all the work you did when you were with the department. Mr. Chair Commissioner Downey, I guess uh, one thing that, that comes to mind is uh, for me on this topic is thinking about how this information gets into the hands of small business owners that are looking to have either a uh, digital uh, uh, component of their brick and mortar uh, store or a fully online business. Uh, how do you, how do we get information to them? Is that is, does the Department of Rehabilitation get involved with that? How, how is your information accessible to them? Or how do they even know where to look or where to start? So uh, it's a really great question. It is one that we've, that we've worked on uh, at, at different times where, so we, we have our workforce development um, uh, operation that does connect with businesses, mostly around helping the people we serve become uh, employed. And uh, there have been, it's been somewhat mixed, right? So, so businesses are covered uh, by, I want to say it's ADA Title III. So they are covered, that it's a bit different. So their requirements for business are somewhat different. Um, so the information that we use that is uh, um, required for state government, it's, it's also, there's a requirement for businesses as well. And um, so they do have access to sort of the same information. And then there, there is outreach. It's, it's, it isn't, I would say that it hasn't been quite the same as what we do in state government because we're, we're charged with the work that we do for government. And there, there, is, there, there have been instances where we've had workshops where businesses have been invited. And uh, I can say for the department, if there's any interest or there's a way that we can be connected with businesses, we're always up for the conversation um, because we can serve our, our consumers, the people we serve uh, by having those conversations as well. So uh, I, I don't have like a formal answer, but uh, I can say that we absolutely are are interested in helping those businesses if 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 they're looking to um, to make their their systems and services accessible. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. This is Chris Downey, Chair Commissioner Downey again. It does make me think how in in our uh, in our state we now have requirements for a few uh, for a business uh, lease uh, requirements that uh, the lease uh, advise the the uh, 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 Lisey, that they uh, should be getting a, a certified access review of their site and things that sort of trigger the awareness of the accessibility re requirements in the built environment. And I'm curious about, <laughs> it'd be great to have some trigger in the digital space of that similar thing, but it's hard to know where that trigger would appropriately live. Uh, so thanks for your comments. Any other comments from members of the commission joining us that are here in person? Uh, this is Commissioner uh, Leon Vasquez. Um, I too had that 
thought of how to, how to get this to small businesses. Um, but most small businesses actually use a bigger platform, such as like Squarespace to host their websites, um, maybe connecting with those companies um, in, so that when you do, because I've, I've, I've done this recently, when you create a new website, there's no you know, red flags or, hey, make sure it's, it's accessible, um, which is kind of a, you know, a, a really good opportunity to have some links, you know, um, such as your, your website to promote and help small businesses be compliant and, and beyond. It's a really interesting point that you raised, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'll, I'll say this about, so, so, uh, Squarespace, actually, their templates are accessible. So as long as you're not posting, um, and it's been a few years since I looked at them, but when I looked at them before, they were they were producing accessible templates. So when you go through and you design your website with Squarespace and you pick one of their templates, it's accessible. Um, but then it's incumbent upon you as the content producer to make sure that you don't ruin the accessibility by then posting in content that is not accessible. So uh, they do have resources. And I know if you, if uh, for a lot of those platforms, if you, uh, if you, if you get support from them, they can help you. So as long as the person setting up the website knows that they do want it to be accessible, the tools will support them. And that's true for most of the larger platforms that are like the commercial platforms and uh, WordPress and Square, uh, Squarespace and all, all these others that are that are sort of the leading providers of those services, they are accessible. But um, to your point, you, you kind of have to know, you, you'd have to know, I know when I looked at them, you, you had to know that you wanted to make it accessible. And then there, you, if you search, you can find the resources. But if you don't have that understanding going in, you, you might not think of it. Um, this is Commissioner L. Hessen. I had my hand raised, but I I wanted to ask a quick question. Is that okay? Yes, you recognize uh, Commissioner L. Hassan. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the possibility of doing a collaborative uh, webinar with CCDA and um, actually putting it up for businesses or marketing that to businesses in order for them to get the information needed to be um, accessible. Is that something that um, I guess Executive Director uh, April would be able to help answer that question? Is that something we can look at in the future? Thank you, Commissioner Dr. L. Hessen. This is uh, Executive Director Dawson Rawlings, and I am going to be, that's a great idea, and I'm going to be sharing um, sort of a part two of this after lunch. Uh, there will be an agenda item where I'll be talking about um, after we've digested what Jake has shared with us, uh, where we go from here, and uh, you, uh, you, that's a spoiler alert. We'll be talking about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other comments from members of the commission joining us virtually or in person? Yeah, this is Commissioner Ramirez. Um, I really want to thank you for this presentation. I think along the same lines as, as trying to provide a resource for our business uh, partners, especially our small partners. I know that sometimes having established uh, templates like the one you mentioned from the companies are really good. Um, they oftentimes don't deploy uh, equitably around platforms, depending on your device. But I wonder if along the same lines, there is some type of technical uh, resource available for companies to ensure that not only the structure that they're creating for their templates is accessible, but that the content is accessible. Um, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm hard of hearing, so I utilize uh, closed captions and, and ASL regularly, but oftentimes, we're seeing more and more of our business partners relying on uh, AI to create uh, the captions, um, or we even have now AI ASL, uh, which is not always really accurate um, or, or even uh, appropriate. And I think that that's like a good strategy to guide our business partners to utilize 
actual certified um, communication uh, interpreters, whether it be CART, uh, sign language, and definitely some of our language support or some other uh, content material if they're using video or audio so that it could be equitably and compliantly accessible. Um, that's one of the questions that I get a lot from folks is like, where can I find, where to find closed captioners, where to find ASL interpreters, or those type of services that businesses can uh, connect with at the local level uh, to ensure that businesses are not compliant, but that they're able to, to reach out to a broader and bigger audience when they're deploying this really nice businesses ideas. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so uh, it, it's really, um, it's such an important current topic, which is uh, just sort of how much of the AI based tools can we use? Um, we know they're not as good. The interpreter services or the captioning um, that we might, or the really the captioning, the, the automated captioning, it's okay if that's if that's what you have access to. Um, but we at the Department of Rehabilitation, um, we always employ um, um, sign language interpreters and, and uh, live caption support for our for our meetings. Um, and I think so this is where there is some um, it's incumbent upon the content creator to use the tools and the so when we talk about a resource, if we're talking about a technical resource where we're saying, hey, there, this is where, where we can learn to apply the techniques and, and approaches that are gonna result in accessible content or accessible services, um, yes, those resources exist. If, if, there, if the goal is a resource that's going to, um, uh, so you can you can find all of the services that you might want. I mean, there are local companies that provide interpreter services. Um, it's a paid service. So uh, so like so many of these kinds of things, you can do it, but you have to actually develop it. I mean, the the, the state of California, our web templates are all uh, fully accessible because we've designed them to be right. So somebody has to go and and do that design work, and there's not. Um, I'm not aware of other than the resources that can can provide the guidance and the support for doing it. So if you if you go on like our website that I put in the chat and you read about all the different ways that um, that you can make content accessible, and then you go and pick up a tool, uh, uh, website design tools, or uh, one of the content creation apps, uh, and you create the content you still have to apply all of those techniques, right? So um, I'm not aware of, of resources specifically for businesses. Again, our, our focus has generally been within government, but um, I think really the answer that we've found is just to make sure that people know where the tools are and then that, that, they, are, that they are aware of their responsibility to create accessible content. Um, so kind of those two things, because Frankly, we get the question a lot. Is there a resource for this? And it, it ends up being they're looking for someone to um, most of the time that they can pay to do it for them or that that they can get the, the expertise for themselves. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much that helps, but I mean, resource is a it's a, it's a key term there. There are there any other comments from members of the commission, either in person or virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no other indication. Thank you. Are there any comments from members of the public that are joining us virtually on this agenda item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. And have any members of the public joined us here in person? Chair Commissioner Downey, this is April. There is no one here in person. Besides us, commissioners. Well, yes, you are all people and you're here too, but no members of the public. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if there are no further comments, uh, we'll continue along our, uh, actually, before I do that, thank you, uh, Mr. Jake Johnson, for joining us. Uh, and thanks for your work at the Department of Rehabilitation. So thanks most for your welcome. time today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. So with that, we'll continue along our uh, trail of the uh, 
CCDA agenda hopscotch off to item seven, I think. Uh, and that's the action regarding the data and our uh, annual reports. So uh, back to you, uh, Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This uh, this agenda topic came up uh, because, as 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 you all know, um, and for those of you who may be new voices in the room, you may not know. So I'll share that you know one of our statutory obligations is to uh, create an annual report of our uh, top ten data and annual activities to the state legislature. And uh, what we do historically, what we have done is uh, when we create uh, from our data, our, our top 10, we, we'll create a top 10 list and we'll do three lists. We'll do a list of the top 10 alleged disability access violations uh, by type of violation. We also do a top 10 list by area. So the region that those violations allegedly occurred. And we, and we also list, uh, Law, we list uh, law firms, but we I, of that are the top ten um, filers. But we do not list the names of the law firms. We only identify them by first, second, third, and so on. And um, in this last uh, legislative cycle, and as well as when uh, there was an, an internal review of our annual report, there were a few people who raised the question of 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 why the commission. Uh, chooses not to identify the law firms uh, and whether or not um, in the interest of uh, being transparent, uh, we should start that practice. And um, after consulting with a few a few others, I, I felt it was important to just bring this to the commission uh, to, to get your thoughts on whether we should, uh, we should uh, do that or what your thoughts are on that. Uh, so we decided to bring this up uh, just to see uh, if we're thinking about all the angles. Uh, we're leaning towards in our, uh, not this current annual report that I'll talk about uh, later, uh, not the one for 2023, but for 2024, um, we're proposing that we do begin naming the law firms just to have consistency and transparency, but we want to make sure that we're thinking of uh, all the right uh, things to think about before we make that decision. So that is why I wanted to, to welcome your, your thoughts and suggestions on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Executive, Executive Director uh, April Dawson Rawlings. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, question and I have lots of thoughts on that but first I'll uh, open it up to members of the commission uh, joining us virtually on this agenda item. Uh, this is Commissioner El Hessen. Um, I agree. I, I think I would like to see the names of those law firms. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the commission here in person that would like to address this agenda item? The commissioner, uh, Drake Dillard. Just a question, just to make sure I understand. I'm assuming when you say law firm or, or name first, you, that's one firm, right? So 42% yes. is actually one firm. That's correct. So we're actually talking about three firms in total with most of the percentage I'm, I'm counting. The majority, uh, sorry, this is Executive Director Dawson. And actually, I, I was remiss that I should describe the visual on the screen for accessibility reasons. And I apologize for skipping that. Um, so I'm going to answer uh, Commissioner Dillard's question, but, I, but I'd like to, I think it'll be helpful if I describe what's on the screen. Uh, currently, what shows in our annual report is we have on the left, uh, there's a chart and on the left, it says law firm and it ranks on based on number of submissions and that refers to submissions to our portal. And it's one, two, and three, and it just says the word law firm and not the name. And then on the, the right, it says percentage, and we just use the 2022 as an example, percentage of filings received by that law firm. So you're, you're correct, Commissioner Dillard, that um, we did take this out of a real report and 42% of the filings that come through our portal, that doesn't mean that they're the filings that um, are received by 
you know, federal and state court. Uh, there may be some that weren't submitted to our portal, but the, for the submissions submitted to our portal, 42% of them came from that one law firm. And we find that historically, the majority of our um, of our of the copies of the filings. And I, I want to be clear that um, for those of you who are new voices, CCDA does not receive original filings. We've received copies of the filings uh, by law in our uh, legal portal, and then we use that data to to create our annual report. But uh, historically, the majority of the data that we, that we receive, the copies of the filings usually come from between three and five law firms. And um, so the proposed change, which is reflected on the right, uh, would name the law firm rather than uh, just say number one, number two, and number three. Um, so it's the same chart, except that we have the word name, name in the place of just you know blank law firm insert here. And if I did not answer your question, Commissioner Dillard, please tell me. <laughs> oh, you did. Thank you. Sure. This is Commissioner Shapiro. Um, one technical item. I think you mean re filings received from that law firm, even though the boxes say filings received by that law firm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we can fix that. Uh, as my perspective is that we definitely should have the names and these names are copies of filings presumably filed with the courts. Court filings are public records. So there is not, in my ex my understanding, there's no expectation of privacy or separation in terms of identifying the law firms. Uh, we're certainly having, they're self-identifying when they file the paperwork and they're identifying in the court when they file the papers. And I think it would be helpful um, to be transparent on, on those numbers and on the names. So does someone else have a uh, comment? Yeah. Oh. oh no, oh, uh, we'll fix them, we'll fix that. <laughs> you have a neighbor there that can help? You guys should right here. Oh. So uh, this is Commissioner Clare. I wanted to state that um, I think it's important to have the names um, according to state law. Individuals, uh, business owners are actually receive legal benefits if they receive a claim by a high frequency litigant, which is not solely an individual. It's also considered a law firm. So if a law firm files more than I think it's 10 a year, um, the business owner has the right to exercise two legal benefits of a 90-day stay at an early evaluation conference. And so I don't know if this is on a public record anywhere or if this report is on the website, but I think by naming them, it's one method to let business owners know that they have the opportunity to have an early evaluation conference and um, a 90-day stay to determine the, the particulars of the case. You. And this is Commissioner Ramirez. So definitely, definitely agree with those considerations, but uh, April Justin, as she stated before, that kind of like quick disclaimer that this are this this data is not necessarily accurate representative because it's just the documents that are that your office received. So it might not be representative of the actual um, legal landscape. And so I think it's important to have that distinction because I did realize that there is um, a benefit that um, you know business can have if there are too many too many complaints coming from law firm from one particular law firm or individual. However, given the fact that this is not the sole sort or repository of where those complaints are uh, monitored or like that we could have an accurate doc doc document, it I'm not saying that it could or it would, but it could give the wrong indication um, to come up with this particular remedy that I was just mentioned. This is Commissioner Luciana Profazza, and I too support having the actual name of the law firm identified. It's Commissioner Dillard again. Just curious, have there been any, I guess, direction in terms of them not having a name? I'm, I'm curious. Why, why now? Why is this coming up now? Is, is it? 
Thank you, Commissioner Dillard. This is Executive Director uh, Dawson Rawlings. This is something that um, I, I noticed it when I first started that, oh, we don't na name, you know, name the names. And um, I was thinking about that and I wasn't sure what the historical perspective was. And also uh, it was brought up when, uh, when the when we, whenever we produce an annual report before it goes to the legislature, it goes through a internal review at DGS and it also, and also there was a legislative partner that asked about it about, uh, and so I, I, I wanted to mostly just get the temperature of the room to see since I haven't been here as long, you know, I, I think it's a good idea for all the reasons mentioned and I support and I and staff and I fully support it, but we wanted to just take the temperature of the commission um, and not just uh, unilaterally decide to change that since our historical practice has been not to name them. Um, I have not heard uh, from from anyone who uh, would oppose it, but I but we haven't done an extensive outreach effort either to see if anyone would, um, which is why we thought we would bring it up to a public meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Um, I agree we should name the law firms, but I do have a question. Would this deter them from maybe filing through us or is this just um, data that we that we get on our own? So it, it's sorry, this is Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. That's a great question. So it's in statute that by law, uh, high frequency litigant uh, have to, uh, they're by law required to submit copies of filings in federal and state court to our legal portal. And what I alluded to earlier is that, you know, we've become aware that there may be a gap between in, in compliance, uh, but we have not done a study. We haven't had the resources up to now to do a study to determine what, if there is a gap and what that gap might be. So me stating that publicly is a, is a presumption based on, um, that we we believe there probably is a gap, but we don't know how large it is. This is uh, Chair Commissioner Downey. Uh, I do think that trying to think back historically uh, as to why uh, they're not named by name, only by uh, law firm number one, one, two, and three, or whatever, uh, it is a peculiar thing, and so it does make me wonder if there was some something in the legislation, the mandate, whatever that required that. Um, I could see both uh, benefit uh, and and uh, some challenges to having that publicly noticed, but uh, so long as there's no nothing that would, would preclude us from listing that, it would seem like a, a most natural adjustment to be made in our reports. Mr. Commissioner Holloway, being that um, those law firms are filing public court records and providing that information to us, the state of California, um, who they are is public information. And, you know, to be honest, if you're in business and you don't want people to know who you are, it's really suspect. This, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. I, I wonder if it would be good PR for them. Uh, any, yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I think they that's they anticipate it's not good PR, which is exactly why they won't, don't want to be known. Just my suspicious mind. Well, uh, are there any other commissioners that would like to address this item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication of any commissioners virtually. Thank you. Are there any members of the public joining us virtually that would like to address this item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication. And I presume we have no members of the public here in person yet. Okay, so with that, I believe we need to take, uh, I'd like to hear a motion to approve that we proceed uh, and uh, 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 our executive director and staff pursue uh, the process of, of uh, formally listing the names uh, in the annual report. Is it limited to the annual report or to the website as well? Both. 
And and just to be clear, this will uh, the the current annual report is I'll share this later being finalized. So this will will this will take effect for the next annual report. Thank you. So could I have a motion to approve? So moved, Commissioner O'Hessen. Could I hear a second? This, uh, Commissioner Holloway, pleased make the second. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, our. Uh, Friendly roll, talk, roll call vote taker, Presley, could you do the honors? Yes, thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I will start. Commissioner Downey? Aye. Commissioner Dillard? Commissioner O'Hessen? Aye. Commissioner Holloway? Aye. Commissioner Jackson? Commissioner Aye. Jackson. Awesome. Um, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Aye. Commissioner Lillibridge. Commissioner Profasa. Aye. Commissioner Ramirez. Aye. Commissioner Shapiro. Aye. Chair Commissioner Downey, all CCDA commissioner votes have been noted and the motion carries. I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for everybody's uh, vote on that. So uh, I know we're running behind schedule. It's after noon and uh, we're at item nine. Can't see ahead to see how many more items do we have before lunch, the official lunch break? This is the, this is the last item, but it, I'm fine with uh, if the commission would like to table it to after lunch also. It's okay with whatever the commission would like to do. I'm fine so long as we don't have to take a roll call vote to do that. <laughs> yeah. Presley needs a break. So, so uh, I'd, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn for lunch and then return to item nine once we return. Um, Second. Yes. You want to do the, make the motion first? Sorry, I thought you were making the motion. I was asking for the motion. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I'll make the motion. We postpone item nine to after lunch. Commissioner Dillard, second. Thank you. Uh, I hope we don't have to. Mr. Chairman, you can uh, approve it by consensus. Yeah, that's what I okay. thought. Okay. So I'll approve by consensus. Thank Aye. you for the and coaching. <laughs> Do, uh, just for clarification, do you still want to come back at one or would you like to give a little more time? Let's see. It is now 1225. Uh, let's see. I'd, it's a little tight, but if we can't like to uh, keep to the, uh, to the schedule for members uh, that might be joining for the afternoon session. Is there any reason why we shouldn't do that? Do we have the latitude to float the adjournment time? The I the um the lunch after lunch is mostly informational items, and so it's not there's no other speakers. And so if you wanted to give a little more latitude, uh, that's that's okay. at your discretion. But uh, I'll uh, let's uh, let's uh, reconvene here at uh, one. 15 Pacific time. So they'll give us, stretch it out a little bit more. I think that'll be adequate and uh, get us back on close to schedule. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So this uh, meeting is adjourned until after lunch. See you at 1.15. Uh, call to order. Return to order for this uh, California Commission on Disability Access. Um, we need to start with taking roll to make sure we have quorum. So, um, Presley, are you there and ready to take the roll call vote or roll. I, <laughs> yes, Chair Commissioner Downey, I am ready to do a roll call vote. I will start with uh, yourself, Commissioner Downey. Present. Commissioner Holloway. Present. Commissioner Dillard. Present. Commissioner O'Hessen. Commissioner O'Hessen. Commissioner Jackson. I'm president. I'm president. <laughs> I'm president. 
Thank you, Commissioner L. Hessen, and thank you, Commissioner Jackson. I have noted both presence. Uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Present. Commissioner Lillibridge. Commissioner Dr. Profasa. Present. Commissioner Ramirez. Present. Commissioner Shapiro. Present. Commissioner Clare. Present. Commissioner Conway. Conway, present. Thank you. And with that, uh, quorum has been met. Everyone is back from lunch. I will pass it back to you, Chair Commissioner Downey. Thank you, Presley. Uh, so, uh, if you recall from our morning CCDA agenda hopscotch, we're on item nine. Uh, and that's the bridging conversation uh, between CCDA and the Department of Rehabilitation. Uh, and this item we're referring back to April, um, Executive Director uh, April Dawson Rawlings. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is April. Well, I want to thank everyone from uh, everyone for coming. I hope you had a good lunch. And I wanted to thank Jake uh, from the Department of Rehabilitation for being a wonderful speaker in our morning session. And I, I, uh, I, I'm sorry that we had to to rush you there, but you did an amazing job. And we look forward to having uh, Department of Rehab back. And this conversation is really part two to really bridge that conversation. Now that we have had uh, Jake come and sort of sort of lay the groundwork for some of the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of website accessibility, uh, I really wanted to share uh, what uh, myself and the staff have been up to based on prior feedback from the commission on what we should be working on, and then uh, get a little bit more feedback from the commission as well as uh, any public who would like to contribute to the conversation. And we have I have some some guiding questions that would be helpful for us to to hear and get some because um, as I know that I've have, I've shared this with you all um, for different uh, agenda items, but um, Assembly Bill 2917 uh, was signed into law during the 2022 legislative session by Governor Newsom. And its impact uh, to CCDA uh, involved expanding our reporting to the California State Legislature. Uh, so we are now including alleged disability access violations related to website in our legal portal and in our uh, in our annual reports, and we also were mandated to develop toolkits and educational modules that focus on um, construction related accessibility violation alleged violations in parking lots and exterior passive travel, uh, which is why we um, had the toolkit conversation earlier. And we were also asked to develop educational modules or a toolkit. Uh, directed at businesses to help facilitate websites accessibility compliance and to partner with organizations such as the Department of Rehabilitation um, and the Division of the State Architect and others. And so when after AB 2917 became law, uh, I had a couple of initial conversations with the Department of Rehabilitation and uh, we are definitely going to be doing, uh, we're planning on in the near future, and those are in, it's in development, but we are planning to do a, uh, a, a co-training on disability access uh, website compliance. Also, uh, as Jake shared during his presentation, uh, they have developed a comprehensive uh, toolkit, a pre-existing toolkit about website accessibility. Uh, they are the, the designated state agency that um, educates Title II entities, uh, which is like, you know, state, state and local governments, uh, Title II of the ADA, uh, state and local governments about website accessibility. Um, as, you, as many of you know, uh, businesses fall under Title III, um, but many of the, the pointers are similar. Um, between those two groups. And so uh, because we have a guide that pre-exists, uh, that's a that's known as a statewide model to educate um, entities on website accessibility. We would we have asked the Department of Rehabilitation for permission to utilize uh, their toolkit to develop our toolkit. So they've given us permission to utilize 
any of the sections that might apply uh, and cross to business accessibility. But we also want to make sure that we're using the right consumer voice and directing it to the people that need to hear it the most. And since all of you represent the business or disability communities, uh, we wanted to just take some feedback from you about what you think would be important to, to see in our toolkit now that I've shared a little bit about our path forward, that we are going to be developing a toolkit using DOR's model. Um, and we are also going to be uh, doing a co-facilitated webinar with them um, to, to uh, using the toolkit to um, educate businesses about uh, website accessibility compliance. And um, we also have been partnering with the Pacific ADA Center, and we've talked with them. Uh, I'll be talking about this uh, later in the agenda, but we have several webinars planned on the ADA with them this year, and we would like one of them to be on website accessibility compliance. So uh, stay tuned for those dates, but those things are happening. And as usual, all of our webinars and trainings will be, uh, we'll have language accessibility, ASL, and captioning as well. So, and, and language and language translation. And so we would really like to hear from you, staff would really like to hear from you about, you know, what information do you think would be valuable for a business owner to understand the ins and outs of website accessibility? And then from the consumer perspective, as an end user, you know, what, what would be important for you to, what would you think that businesses should know about website accessibility and enforcement and your legal rights? So those are questions I wanted to pose and see if you had suggestions for as we, as we move forward with these developing, developing projects. Thank you. Hi, this is Commissioner Leon Vasquez. I have a question. Um, so it's, uh, you're going to create a guide to educate on website accessibility compliance. Is it just going to have like, this is how you can comply or will it, I mean, it will have, this is how you can comply, but will it have links to actually change your website? Cause I know there's, there's businesses out there that you sign up, you pay and they make your website accessible outside of like um, your host website. Is it going to be something like that or will, will the CCDA have something like that where we can sign up and change our website or do, do, is it just giving you the knowledge of these are the compliances? You know, at this point, we've 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 talked to we've talked to legal counsel and we've we've also been having conversations you know, with others that have used those tools. And there's so many of them out there that it's hard to know which ones are, which ones are legitimate and which ones are the best practice. And so uh, our thought at the staff level has been that we'll, we'll educate on the, 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 uh, the Department of Justice federal, um, federal guidelines. There aren't any regulations yet. Um, we're waiting for those, but there are guidelines. And so the WCAG is uh, named as a guideline. And so what we're talking as a best practice to use those. And so we're talking about in, in our trainings and our toolkit to refer to the WCAG and also to talk about, you know, practical examples of how to make, you know, for example, how to make your, your websites accessible and more welcoming to customers with disabilities. Um, so we're, so to answer your direct question, we're, we, we've been sort of advised to sort of stay away from um, like be, becoming a place where businesses could, we don't want to certify that we're the place to go to push a button and make your website accessible. I know that I know, I know that I'm, comp, I'm I know I'm oversimplifying what you're saying, but so. <laughs> uh, this is chair commissioner Downey. It, it occurs to me that uh, as, as we did and uh, years ago with the commission, we started with uh, uh, ad, uh, advising small business owners that there's a big issue of, are you a place of public accommodation? And I think understanding that in the digital space and before talking about um, you know, the mechanics of an accessible website and digital interface, it's um, business applied to, to me as a small business owner. 
Uh, and that seems like perhaps a, a, a silly question to pose today, but uh, I think that's a, like the place to start. Any other comments from members of the commission uh, joining us virtually? Um, yes, this is Commissioner Lassen. And in response to um, the executive director's questions, I was interested in, um, from a consumer perspective, that whatever assistive devices that are on the computer, that somehow the website would be compatible, whether it's um, voice activated, for example, um, and using that particular website. So I guess making sure it interfaces with other accessible devices that people with disabilities use on a regular basis in order to do whatever business they're doing. And from the business perspective, I think it's important that we share of uh, the whole context of inclusion and being expanding their business based on having a larger population of consumers that would um, support their businesses and also give consumers more um, choice options in regards to businesses. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez again. Um, I might be restating the same thing I did earlier, just in a different way. Um, but you asked about information useful um, that would be useful to business owners on the website. And while a lot of the information is absolutely useful for us to know, um, a lot of us don't know how to do web design. So I, I, if I can just say again, um, while we can't um, <clears throat> directly tell people this is, you know, here's a link to do all the things that you need to do, maybe partnering with a few companies and, you know, having a disclaimer there, like we're not, liable for anything this company does or doesn't do for you, but having those resources, those links, because I know when I was trying to do, um, when, I, when I was searching, there's, there's, there's a lot of third party and it'd be nice to just have like the more raw resources. Thank you. Um, this is Commissioner Shapiro. Uh, disclaimers are sometimes very problematic. Um, even though the disclaimer says that we're not warranting or, or, or you shouldn't rely, um, depending on how it's phrased, people can take it as reliance. So if we are going to go in that direction, it's going to be very important that we get some very firm legal advice for wording, um, because sometimes disclaimers don't work when people say, well, I didn't understand that. I thought this you were, you were a platform for resources. This was a resource. So... Um, I'm all in favor of providing as much information as we can to help people comply, but we do need to make sure we're cautious on the wording when we provide that kind of information. This is Commissioner Ramirez. So thank you for this particular question. I think from a, um, from a public position, I think one of the things that I would look given the fact that there's a lot of different toolkits, it's some guidance in what we know we can expect or that we, like they, 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 they what is the expectation of compliance that we have? And definitely a, a linkage to that so that we can definitely resource it and how to resolve any type of discrepancies um, would be the direction. So definitely having the statutory um, baseline for what are the, Things that we can expect our business partners to have um, in terms of accessibility uh, can give us a good playing field in in having that that exchange with with business partners as, as we develop those partnerships. Uh, but then at the same time, in those cases where those minimum requires is obviously not there, uh, where can we as an as a as, as a consumer as a community member uh, really follow up either through partnership through their education or whatever other state um, thing is, is necessary to help to access those goods and services um, would be the expectation as a consumer, uh, but also particularly coming from an intercultural perspective, given the fact that litigation oftentimes is not an approachable thing for, for most equity-seeking populations. 
So really having um, some really fundamental um, starting information for, for community members, not necessarily in plain language, but community language, because uh, they legally said that all sometimes it's so intimidating to both the consumer and the business owner, because this is very arbitrarily based, uh, difficult to understand. So really having some sort of community language is perhaps the most helpful thing to have. Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication of any virtual commissioners. Okay, thank you. Uh, this this Chair Commissioner Downey, and and thinking about it, I uh, I think in this digital space, there's uh, they don't have a lot of the safe same safeguards uh, in digital space that you have in in the physical space with various permits and you know, approvals you have to get along the way. So uh, it can be easy for uh, small, business, small business owners uh, or anyone to not uh, be aware of what's required. So I think it's going back to sort of prompting the question, identifying the, the need and that's, and, and even sort of how to advise on how to procure an accessible website, what to ask for. Uh, you may not be doing it yourself, but you want to acquire it and you need to uh, ask the right questions, make the, you know, make the right, um, uh, issue the right requirements before the website's made or before whatever digital platform's made. So there's, there's the questions to ask on the approach to building the website. And then as, as uh, uh, our speaker, um, Jake Johnson pointed out how to maintain that through content uh, and that becoming more sort of the, the domain of the, the business owner and contributing and maintaining that uh, accessible content over time. Any other comments from members of the commission? This is Commissioner Luciana Frasazza. My question is, are there currently any funds available to assist small businesses in developing their websites to ensure that they're accessible? Thank you for that question. I will, I will research that. I think that there, I know that there are uh, funds available for accessibility improvements in general, but I can research if there are specific grants available for uh, website accessibility. And I'll bring that to our next meeting. Can I add to that question? Is it possible and maybe could we explore the possibility of using high frequency litigation funds for that purpose? Uh, hi, sorry, <laughs> you say hi. Uh, hi, hi, Commissioner Dr. Prafatsa. Um, the high, I'll be sharing this in the financial portion, but the, the high frequency litigant funds um, have to be encumbered um, by uh, June 30th of this year. And it doesn't, although it doesn't say that we can't be grant makers, I think setting up a grant making program, I don't, I don't think that that would be be feasible based on how the fund is set up and, and, and the sunsetting, given the sunsetting of the funds. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that CCDA can't play a role in, in, in convening those conversations to figure out how, how, how that might happen in the future or with another, or if there's another agency that's already doing that, that I'm just not aware of, how we could all leverage our resources to figure out how to get those dollars to, to businesses. This is Chair Commissioner Downey, I, and think about there's, in, in the physical world, that's done in local jurisdictions where they have the, the funds that they use for various programs and things. And being that the digital environment is less location specific, it, it would seem to uh, sort of fall outside of what is sort of being pretty reasonably established for that kind of accessibility improvement, but it's a very different animal. Uh, it'd be curious to explore, to see uh, perhaps less about what we could do as CCDA to do that, 
but is there any other tie-in for local jurisdictions that do make those funds available for special um, uh, uh, special programs towards increasing accessibility? This is uh, Commissioner Sarian Shapiro. I had a question about whether there are any resources to indicate to businesses what sorts of steps they need to take with respect to their website above and beyond uh, the accessibility packages currently being provided, uh, for example, in the in the phones. Um, it seems that there are some people who are coming from a place where if the product is providing, for example, reading services or uh, different other accessibility features, there may be confusion on what additional steps they need to take that are not covered and educating in that area might also be useful if there were any resources about what to the technology doesn't cover and to make sure that those are the things they look at to dispel the theory or the, the, the myth that the features in the technology will cover what they need to do. No, thank you for that point. And just to just to respond to that, one of one of the aspects of uh, AB 2917 was that uh, CCDA collect um, pre-existing resources and add them to our website. And we've been we've been actively doing that. There is a, a place on our website uh, that you can navigate to 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 read about um, pre-existing uh, toolkits and things like that. And I'll, I'll check specifically if we cover that. And if we don't, uh, I just want to let everyone know that that um, we will be, uh, all of your uh, suggestions today are being taken down and um, staff will review uh, the notes from this meeting and the recording to make sure that we follow up on, on, on those specifics. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Leon Vasquez. I have a um suggestion for the consumer part uh, might be useful if you had um, something you, you can copy and paste like uh, is your is your favorite website not accessible copy and paste here and you can dm or email um, the business directly thank you Sorry, this is Commissioner Leon Vasquez again. And another one might be maybe add adding um, the website to a, a link that you that we provide, um, and then maybe it it sends them like an automatic newsletter or email, like somebody voted your website into the program. Here's more information. Might might be. I don't know if I worded that correctly. I'm following you. Any other comments from members of the commission uh, here in person or virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there's no indication in the chat. Thank you. Just, just one more comment from uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. I just wanna say thank you also um, as a consumer side and, and a business owner. Um, this is something that's gonna be really useful and I can't wait to see you know the the impact that it will have on on uh, small businesses, not just for small businesses, but also for accessibility worldwide. So thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for your your all, for everyone. Thank you everyone for your your feedback. And all of this is going to be really helpful as we develop our toolkit and our uh, co modules with uh, DOR, uh, which stands for the Department of Rehabilitation. And um, at a future meeting, we will share uh, we will share the the end product with you, and we will um, get gain feedback again and um, be able to disseminate that to the people who need it the most. Thank you, but uh, we're not done. We have a we're not done. Sorry. <laughs> comments from members of the public joining us virtually. Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication in the chat. And has anybody joined us here in person uh, at lunch? No one is in person. Okay. So then now we're done with that item. Okay. So thank you. But uh, I uh, seem to, since we skipped around, I, I lost track of some things, other business we needed to handle. 
uh, after the roll, uh, the the uh, roll call uh, for attendance, uh, it was all supposed supposed to ask if there are members of uh, the commission, legislature, uh, others um, that uh, are joining us this afternoon virtually. Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. And then uh, were there any members of the public joining us virtually uh, for this afternoon session that would like to identify themselves? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. Okay, um, and we've already identified nobody's here in person from the public. So we'll go on to item number 10. Okay, so uh, that's the update uh, and discussion regarding the 23-24 legislative session. So uh, I think again, I'm to return this over to our executive director, April Dawson. Rawlings. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. And uh, may I ask, is um, is Karina Roy or Richard Rojas uh, here today on the Zoom from um, the Office of Legislative Affairs? If so, you can say hello. <laughs> okay. Hi, Amy. April uh, Executive Director April Dawson. Uh, they are not on the Zoom okay. right now. I just wanted to check. I, I touched base with them. Um, so you will you may notice that this agenda item looks a little bit different. And this is normally the part of the agenda where uh, uh, Karina Roy, who is our Office of Legislative Affairs um, analyst, uh, talks about the bills that are currently um, on our bill tracking sheet. Uh, DGS, which is the department that uh, CCDA, is, uh, CCDA is administratively nested in, um, in terms of our staff. Um, and, and administrative support. They provide bill tracking to us on, on, on a monthly basis. And because the two bills that are currently on the bill tracking have been are, are two-year bills that haven't been acted on yet in this legislative session um, and, we're, and we're, became two-year bills in the last legislative session and we've already reported on them, uh, we thought it would actually be a good idea since this is the first meeting of the year to just give a high-level conversation about how CCDA has uh, fulfilled one of its mandates to provide technical assistance to the legislature. So one of, uh, one of uh, CCDA's purposes is to provide the legislature uh, with education and technical assistance uh, related to you know, legislation that may impact uh, the disability community related to our purview, which is to you know, increased disability access across California. And so in the last legislative session, we actually stepped up our efforts to let the legislature know that we're here and available to provide that nonpartisan uh, technical assistance. And so we did provide technical assistance uh, to two to two legislative to two legislators. Uh, and we also um, introduced ourselves to our, our new uh, legislative uh, ex officio members and, and visited their offices and told them what we do and educated them on our, on our mission and welcomed them to the commission. And we also gave technical assistance on over a dozen bills. Um, in the last legislative session, we, um, we provided DGS with our take on uh, legislative analysis. And uh, Abigail, who Abigail Ridge is our uh, legislative administrative and legislative analyst, and so she prepared those, and uh, I edited them, and then we sent them on. And so we we are being one of the things that was the goal of our legislative committee, and a lot of the the, the what I've heard from commissioners is that even though CCDA can't take positions on legislation, we are we are still here to be a, a voice to help. Uh, legislators, you know, understand the issues that are under our purview, you know, particularly increasing business access to people with disabilities. And also through our annual report, our annual report is used by legislators and uh, trade organizations and small businesses. And I, everywhere I go, I hear about how our, our annual report really is being read and uh, really is a tool to help educate businesses on some of the, the hot spots that they should be looking out for as far as accessibility. So we I just wanted to share that we have stepped up our technical assistance and that 
Um, we are, along with our partnership with the Office of Legislative Affairs, you know, are available to provide that type of, you know, nonpartisan technical feedback. Um, and so I just wanted to share that and uh, that I'm really proud of our team this year that we were able to, to start providing technical analysis on bills as well as uh, make, some, make some visits to let people know in the legislature uh, that we're here to assist them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from commissioners joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Thank you. Sorry, this is Commissioner Hessen. Okay. I'm slow in, sure in hitting my button. Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to the staff and to our executive director for um, her work in um, keeping us informed and also um, giving us more visibility in that arena. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any uh, comments from members of the commission here in, in person? Okay. Are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually on this agenda item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay, and I'll assume we still have no uh, members of the public with us here in person. So we'll, uh, there are no further questions, comments. We'll move on to agenda item number 11. Okay. Uh, so that's a discussion of uh, CCDA uh, projects and meetings. And measure that. Back to <laughs> Commissioner April Dawson Rawlings. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is April. Well, I know that, that um, at our last uh, meeting in October, there was a discussion about wanting to give visibility to, you know, what, what the CCDA staff have been working on, um, particularly what we've been working on in between our meetings. Um, and also just what we're working on as far as our work plan for the year. And so I just wanted to share a couple of highlights of some projects that we've been working on and, and get your feedback and comments. And I know that some of these projects all sort of uh, do higher level and some all deep dive uh, because they're, they're addressed in other parts of the agenda. Um, but as, as many of you know, and for new voices in the room, we, have, uh, we do a lot of our work through committees. So we have our executive committee and our executive committee this year will be working on um, our strategic plan, beginning our strategic planning process as well as uh, our bylaw uh, revisions. And so staff have been working in between meetings to, um, to prepare for those future, future meetings and revisions um, and doing administrative work for that. Uh, we also, the, the Education and Outreach Committee will be meeting um, in a couple of weeks in April to uh, talk about our social media pilot as well as our accessible parking campaign to talk about how we are going to to utilize to 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 do outreach for those projects. And so, for example, um, how we can leverage our social media presence to get APC out there, the our accessible parking campaign toolkits out there, as well as you know just increasing our our presence on social media. So we staff have been uh, working on Presley. Uh, Strother is our um, education and outreach coordinator uh, who also staffs that committee. And so what she's been working on with, 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 with management has been to create um, more, more content on social media for our social media pilot. And I, I'll be talking about the pilot a, a little bit later in our outreach conversation. But I just wanted to let you know that in between meetings, we've been working on our pilot and, and we've started posting on Facebook and uh, YouTube. And then also our legislative committee will be meeting uh, in a few weeks as well. And in between meetings, we've been um, you know talking to the, I shared a little bit about what we've been working on in terms of uh, what we did for our, our, the last legislative session, as far as our le legislative uh, conversations and, um, getting bill analysis and where they need to go. And so staff works on that in between meetings as well. Uh, there is also a business listing um, that I know uh, we've been we've been working on uh, to create a a mini toolkit 
uh, to educate businesses on some of the top high level alleged disability access violations and how they can prevent those at their businesses. And um, that project has, has, has uh, we've created a draft and we are um, waiting for a, a, some, some other information some things with APC and some other things had to happen for us to finalize that, but that's that's happening. And um, we also have been um, working on some portal upgrades, uh, which I'll talk about in another agenda item more in depth. And um, also what staff works on in between um, our meetings is planning for our listening forum. So this year we're planning four listening forums. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in our outreach uh, portion. Um, and we're also creating a hybrid training for a municipality as well as uh, three hybrid training, three three online trainings, excuse me, uh, with the Pacific ADA Center. So we have we've been working on our partnership with the P Pacific ADA Center, um, and we're, we've planned quarterly uh, webinars. And we also have been spending time revising our toolkits. Uh, to present to you today for accessible parking campaign. And so I just want to take a moment to, you know, really highlight the hard work of our staff um, who makes who makes the magic happen. So, you know, I mentioned Abigail. She, Abigail is our administrative and legislative analyst. And in addition to the legislative work that she's done, she's also, um, she's also been the, um, she was really the heart and soul at the staff level for the accessible parking campaign. She really, you know, made was the person who really kept it going and believed in it from the beginning and made sure that I was I was going to believe in it too when I came on and didn't know what it was until until I because I started in the middle of the planning and and she really made sure that the group felt welcome and and kept everything on task doing all the work that had to happen to bring all the group together um you know and I also want to uplift Presley who is our um, education and outreach coordinator who um, has worked really hard on our social media pilot, getting things out on social media. And um, also you hear her voice. She's the voice behind the curtain in our little Wizard of Oz here today. And um, I, I also wanna highlight, you know, Stephanie's work on the portal, you know, without her leadership on the portal, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but she really is the staff liaison uh, between us and DGS when it comes to the, the patches that need to happen to make sure that law firms are able to utilize our drop-down menus um, and to work on the back end of the portal. So I want to thank Stephanie for that. And Phil, of course, has ran out of the room, but <laughs> I also want to say that, you know, um, he left, but he's coming back. But um, I want to also highlight operation manager Phil McFall because he, super, he supervises our program staff and um, he um, is, has been a great partner and, and, and le helps uh, make sure the day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day goes smoothly, smoothly, making sure that all, all the things that happen to make meetings happen, you know, our vendor relationships, um, you know, just what you see before you hear, a lot of those things happen, you know, be, they're the things that you don't think of because you take them for granted. So I want to thank Phil's, Phil for his leadership on, on, on the operation side of things. And so I hope that this gives you sort of a snapshot of, um, of the life of, you know, of CCDA, particularly at the staff level in between meetings and, and all the work that we're working on. And I just want to give, um, give a real shout out to, I, I feel like we just have the most outstanding team in, in the state. And I'm just really proud of everyone that, that, that works for us. So. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, this is Chair Commissioner Downey. Are there any comments from members of the commission joining us virtually? Hi, Chair Commissioner. Uh, I am not Chair. I've elevated myself. Commissioner Conway, um, thank you all so much to the staff and also apologies. I just realized that I had not re-enabled my video um, after the lunch break, so I've corrected that error. But most importantly, thank you to the staff for all your hard work a hard and excellent work. Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no other indication for virtual commissioners. Thank you. Uh, any comments from members of the commission here in person on this agenda item? Good. 
This is Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you again to all the staff, particularly for making the meetings accessible and helping us along the way. It really, you really model uh, the state. So I really want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, the staff. You've uh, made us all complacent here with a nice lunch. <laughs> Trying to get our engines back up again. So uh, no, thanks to every to the staff for all you do and uh, for that report on on meetings and prog projects for the year. Any other comments from members of the commission, virtually or in person? Hearing none. Are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay, thank you. And uh, still have no one here in person from the public, so we'll move on. Uh, if there are no further questions, move on to item 12. So that's uh, time for our uh, discussion on the strategic, strategic planning and timeline. And, all right, uh, Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings, you're up again. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I wanted to uh, give a high level summary of where we are with our strategic planning process and also to engage with the full commission about conversations that have been having at the executive committee level, um, because the, the executive committee and my desire as well is to make sure that um, you're engaged in that conversation as we move forward. So our current, we are currently um, on the final year of a five-year strategic plan, and our current strategic plan expires at the end of 2024, and it expires at the end of the calendar year, not the state um, budget year. Uh, I have met twice with the executive committee to talk about sort of the, to talk about the scaffolding of how to begin the process and um, had some conversations with them uh, to, to, to find out how we can begin the process of creating the strategic plan that will guide our organization for the next three to five years. Um, and the executive committee um, has asked me to uh, start the process of engaging a consultant. So that involved uh, creating a scope of work and going out to bid for somebody who uh, can come in from the outside to help guide help, help guide us. And uh, so I have done that. And um, I have learned a few things about the contract process uh, in the last year and a half. So I, I learned that there is a way uh, to engage with a consultant um, in a way that would not be as cumbersome of a contracting process there's some there's some some things that I learned to uh, to to hopefully have a, a consultant in in place um, in a reasonable amount of time um, by going through uh, the state's um, CMAS list, which is a list of preferred vendors that have already been approved, and going through fair and reasonable. And so I've done that as a way to cut costs, but as also to to speed up the timeline. Um, and I'll share updates with you with the executive committee as that goes forward. And um, there's also been a conversation about um, the need to have a work group that is made up of commissioners and stakeholders to, to guide the strategic planning process along with the consultant. Um, and uh, Dr., uh, Commissioner Dr. L. Hessen uh, volunteered uh, to, to lead such a work group. The work group hasn't been created yet because we're still in the beginning stages of wanting to make sure that we, we bake this correctly. And the executive committee also wanted me to ensure that the full commission uh, was um, involved in this conversation so that it wasn't just the same people who, you know, create those, those things and that we also, when we're thinking about doing this through the lens of equity and making sure we're thinking about what voices are not in the room, how can we work with the consultant to, and uh, whatever stakeholder group is formed to ensure that we're we're moving in the right direction. So I wanted to get to get all of your thoughts, um, and um, then I will take them back and uh, use that in. Um, moving forward with our with our strategic plan. So the next step will be once the consultant is 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 hired and engaged with me, 
I will make sure that they're looped into the executive committee as well as the, the, the group that, that, is, that is formed. And also there has been conversation about ensuring that there are, uh, in addition to an internal stakeholder group, making sure we broaden it so it's not, as I said before, the same, the same people sort of recycling a lot of the same thoughts. We want to make sure we're bringing in new voices. So there's been conversation about the idea of having um, like a, almost like a listening form for a strategic planning. Like I'm sure many of you have been involved in organizations that have done a SWOT analysis, things like that. So we'll be, so in the scope of work, I kept it very broad uh, so that when the consultant comes, um, they can help help us guide this help guide this process, but I also wanted to make sure that the expectation was set that we want to make sure that we have um, a diversity of voices to help guide our work for the years to come. So that's where we're at at this point, and I'll be re reporting at future meetings on the progress, and you'll all be involved. And I, I'd love to hear your your thoughts about how to move forward as well. Thank you, Executive Director April Dawson Brawlings. Are there any comments from members of the commission joining us virtually? Um, this is Commissioner Lehessen. When you talk about external consultant, I mean, uh, sorry, um, stakeholders, are you, I was thinking DOR or the Silk, are those groups what you're thinking about or am I off track? Hi, Commissioner Dr. L. Hessen. Well, I think that, that that's a perfect, those are two examples of stakeholders that 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 should be at the table. And, it, and I definitely, I think the reason why we want to make sure that we're getting a lot of input is to make sure that this isn't, this isn't Director Dawson Rawlings strategic plan. It's not Commissioner, you know, Dowdy's strategic plan. It's, it's the commissions and, and, and our, and the way that we've really been making strides to uh, as particularly in the last two years to, to make sure that our values like live out in the community and the work that we do. And so those two groups are, are, could be a perfect place to, to advertise for, you know, stakeholders and to ask them for input. And one of the reasons why I think it's vital to have an outside consultant help us, help us put that together um, is because that way, you know, myself and staff and commissioners can take ourselves out of the weeds, so to speak, and really um, let let a professional sort of guide the process, so that we can, so that we don't bring, you know, our limitations as people into into the into the conversation. But those are two great ideas for partners, and we'll make sure to note those to reach out to them. Okay. Also, disability rights organization. Um, Thank you. Like Thank Disability you. Rights California and and right, others. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I'm sorry. Yes. I should have been more specific. No, that's okay. <laughs> There's several. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further comments from members of the commission joining us virtually, are there any comments from members of the commission joining us in person? Thank you. This is Commissioner Shapiro. Uh, I'd like to comment to the timing. Normally, a, a successful strategic plan, even though they're done as five-year plans, is usually reviewed after two or three years, and a new five-year plan is fashioned based on what's already been accomplished, what needs course correction to accomplish it, and what the next accomplishment would be. Given that um, you made a comment that we're on the last year of our strategic plan, I'm assuming that that sort of interim review and update didn't happen before. Uh, as the plan is put together this time, I think it would be useful to make sure that the plan does say that even though it's a five-year plan, that it will be reviewed either every other year or at the three-year mark. And then the new five-year plan, it truly becomes a living document that moves forward in time. So we never actually get to the last year of a plan again as part of the process. Thank you. Are there any other comments from members of the commission? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair sure, Commissioner Downey, there is no indication in the chat. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Downey, I was slow to press my button here. Okay. Commissioner Luciana Prefazza. 
And the question is, in the past, our, our last strategic planning process, how did we engage specific members of our community, different from organizations, business organizations, but rather businesses and specific people with disabilities requiring access? Thank you for that question, Commissioner Dr. Profatsa. And although I wasn't here for, for, the, for that historical perspective, I did do some research in that we did, we did host um, some community gatherings. Um, and also we did a, we conduct, we did conduct a survey um, of stakeholders. Um, and so I'm not sure if there are uh, commissioners who have who have been here longer than I who'd like to also share what that what that experience was like who were there for that first iteration that we're on. But I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but that is my understanding is that we did do we did surveys and and those things and so we'll be it'll be similar to that, but also. I really want to make sure that we, and I know I'm I'm not the only one that also the executive committee and others want to make sure that um, we're we're brainstorming who's not at the table right now and why aren't they there and how can we bring them here to to and how can we overcome barriers to communication um, because obviously if we have a community forum we have to make sure it's accessible and we have to make sure there's access for language and others and thinking about transportation and so um, working with the consultant to make sure that those things are baked into the outreach plan will be important. Thank you. If there are no more comments from members of the commission, uh, hey, are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. So uh, if there are no further comments, then we'll move on to agenda item number 13 in the discussion on uh, equity in C CDA. And again, it's uh, time for Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings. I'm getting used to the additional name. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. This is uh, Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. I have to say it to get used to the name also. <laughs> Well, what I wanted to do today was to just have a high level discussion um, and an, an update all of you on how uh, we have been doing work to move us toward working toward the lens of equity. Um, as, as many of you, as all of us know, uh, equity can't just be, you know, a, a word on an, on an agenda or a one off. It has to be, you know, integrated into how we do business. And I know, you know, in the last several years, there, there are many groups um, you know, speaking in my prior role, uh, the disability community, when I was running community organizations related to disability, we really had a lot of reckoning about, um, you know, righting wrongs and making sure that we were including people at the table who had a variety of disabilities from a variety of backgrounds and really looking at our work intersectionally and how, you know, power dynamics play into that and those things. And, um, Governor uh, Governor Newsom in late 2022 uh, issued an executive order about equity. Uh, the executive order is the number N1622, and he directed state departments to provide, you know, measurable and meaningful outcomes related to equity. And so we've been doing that work, you know, I've been doing that work as, a, as, a, as an employee of, of CCDA and DGS, but also it made us think about how, um, how the boards and commissions that uh, receive state dollars are, are working through the lens of equity. And so some of the things that we have done since then have been, uh, we have made a commitment that we're going to translate our materials into at minimum the 12th the 12 top threshold languages in California, as well as the threshold languages and in any community we do outreach to, such as our listening forums. We also, uh, we also committed um, 
to a con to a contract. It's a one year contract with the addition with the option to extend for two additional years to a, a firm that provides our language access. So in the past, we have provided language access in um, Mandarin, Spanish, and um, Mandarin, Spanish. And, and English and at minimum. And now we've expanded that to this firm can provide over 200 languages. Uh, we've also made a commitment that at, at each of our uh, listening forums and webinars that we will offer you know, language access as an accommodation. And we're also uh, planning for next year, having forums be, be in other languages and be targeted to uh, communities that that we serve that are subpopulations of some of the places that we may be regularly reaching out to. For example, I'll be talking about our outreach in the county of Monterey, and the county of Monterey has a Oaxacan community um, that sometimes experiences barriers to attending listening forums and, and going to county buildings to attend those types of forums. And so our plan is to utilize, you know, cultural brokers and our translation services to, to go to those communities. And so we really want to make sure that, um, you know, when, when, when we look at the data of um, the high frequency litigation and the, and the makeup of the businesses that experience that, many of them are immigrant owned, um, owned by people of color or um, under resourced in some other way. And so um, I think that, you know, how we can, as a commission, look at the lens of equity is thinking about how do we center those voices? And also while, when we've been going out and doing our listening forums, we've been really asking our community partners in each community how, how they want to set the table for our forums. You know, some of our community members really like our sort of like the format that we take from community to community because it's successful, but many of them also put their own spin on it um, because we want to ask them you know, what do you think? What are the resources that you need in your community? So, and I, I would say that one of the things that I'm most proud of, of what CCDA has been working on in the last year has been, you know, really centering those voices and bringing state resource. It really means something to those local jurisdictions when we come in and do trainings and have forums and provide technical materials in, you know, languages that resonate with them. It makes them feel like this that the state is listening, the CCDA, as well as, as well as the state having the, the backing of the state of California coming into these communities, you know, and leveraging resources. And so those are some of the things that we've done. We know it's not a complete picture. We know that, you know, as we move toward our strategic planning process and think about thinking about how CCDA wants to show up in the community over the years to come, you know, there's more work to do. Um, but I did want to start off just sharing uh, that there that there have been strides made in the last year um, and that uh, we are uh, working toward the spirit of the executive order to make sure that CCDA really infuses equity into how we do business. And I think it'll be important, you know, as we think about, you know, who we want to be in the community, thinking about you know, what does it mean for CCDA to provide equity and how does equity respond to our mission and purpose and, and maybe having some conversations over the next few years about, you know, what is our definition of equity? You know, do we need to have equity statements or an equity mission statement, things like that. So just wanted to share a little, little update of where we're at with that and get your thoughts on, on how we could further our work in the equity space uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Executive Director Dawson Rawlings. So, uh, are there any comments from members of the commission joining us virtually on this item regarding uh, equity and CCDA? Yeah, this is this is Commissioner Ramirez. Uh, I just had a comment. So I really appreciate this particular work. And I know, uh, Executive Director, you and I haven't really had an opportunity to, to speak. Um, I know this. This has something that you've been trying to work for the past couple of months. And so I really appreciate this particular update. Um, but just as N1622 talks about having measurable outcomes, uh, the intent of the law was to have those measurable outcomes identified beforehand and then really tracking and development rather than kind of have a product at the end and say, this is what we've done. So just kind of clarification of the intent of that. 
Yes, I remember um, that was part of the work we were trying to do. And definitely having an identifiable equity statement or goal of what how that is going to be operationalized is, is, is paramount to that particular work. But I do really hope moving forward that this particular uh, approach is intentionable and it is not, and because I know it is, because I, I know you and I know the commission, uh, but I also know there's a lot of work, but really have it be um, something that is planned rather than at the end so that it doesn't feel like a last minute kind of approach. Uh, I know I spoke with you when I was on the plane and you were gonna give me an update. And that just felt as an equity kind of priority, it really didn't feel like it was a priority to be getting kind of an update the day before us like getting on the plane. And so it really, it really felt weird uh, just, just to kind of really, and I know that's not the intent, but it really puts, puts on the, the intent of equity in this particular field is significantly important given our diverse stakeholder process in California. And so I really hope that there's a more um, um, direct approach to doing this, originally setting those markers at the beginning so that you can actually measure them rather than perhaps having materialized source the end. Um, and I know this is a brand new era uh, in many er places as they're, they're looking to implement this, but definitely looking to our Office of Health Equity, the Department of Rehabilitation that are doing similar works. Um, but I really wanna thank you for this. Um, I was looking at, at your, your language accent, that's a measurable goal. Uh, your threshold language is a measurable goal. And then the utilization of cultural brokers, that's a significant uh, measurable goal um, that I think uh, can be planned ahead. And there's a variety of other ones that are really, really beneficial for our small business partners, particularly our disability <laughs> community that is trying to develop some of this, you know, new ventures. And definitely our uh, language uh, accessibility is really greatly appreciated. I love the Oaxaca example. Yes, Spanish is, is, a, is, is a significant language, but even for our Hispanic and indigenous communities, Spanish is not our primary language. So I really appreciate you having gone way above that for that. Um, and so please don't don't think of this as me being harsh because I'm not, I'm just trying to be delivered uh, so that it comes across clear because I think this is a really great opportunity to strengthen the, commu the, the commission in the work that you do because just looking at your staff and looking at the commission, and I really, really want to be able to support you and the commission in this particular. Thank you for your comments and feedback. I really appreciate it. Are there any other comments from commissioners uh, here in person or virtually? Um, this is Commissioner O'Hessen and I just want to share a thought that was coming to my mind and basically that equity and inclusion um, need, need to be active and they're fluid, meaning as we change or as we expand as a society or even um, as people with disabilities move forward, I think the equity portion of it is a fluid portion, meaning that it evolves. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about that and how, how is that measurable um, like each step of the way as we're looking at it? It's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dr. L. Hessen. And I, I think that also goes back to to the points that um, Commissioner Shapiro and, and uh, Commissioner Ramirez made about being intentional, but all, and then also Commissioner uh, Shapiro's point about making sure that, for example, our strategic plan um, is is also fluid and also becomes a living document. And so, if there's is if there's a way for us, I, I think it would be a good idea for us to make sure that we're infusing equity into our strategic plan, equity measures. Um, what I've seen done and then also regularly reviewing it so that as, as you said, it's not like, oh, we're at the last year of our plan and we're dusting it off, you know, and, um, you know, and so, uh, I think that, you know, in the future, the, my plan is to make sure that, that af after we go through the development process over the next, you know, 12 to 15 months and, and then approve the plan, you know, making sure that the plan includes, this is when the plan will be reviewed. And um, because you're right, you know, equity and inclusion is fluid and it's something that has to be alive in the, in, in the work that we do. And I know that I, I try to, 
I'm, I'm somebody who, you know, knows that I, one of my favorite phrases that I say is I want to do right and not be right. And part of the reason why I say that is it's one, one of the things that I've learned through taking some equity training classes is that it's important to have sentences that you say in your mind that, that interrupt, you know, thoughts that could be unequitable thoughts or thoughts that could not help an organization move forward in this manner. So that's one of my mind tricks is I say, I want to do right and not be right. Um, knowing that I have a lot to learn also. Yes, exactly. Thank you. There, if there are no further comments from members of the commission, are there comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay. And if there are no further questions or comments, uh, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number 14, the executive director report. And it's back to uh, executive director, April <laughs> Dawson Rawlings. Thank you, Phil. I think we're going to have to re uh, have have some uh, vocal styling change in some of our some of our meetings. I'll have to we'll have to look and see how you can uh, hear from some of our amazing staff and not just me. <laughs> um, so uh, and just just for visibility of uh, being transparent, the reason I'm looking at my phone is because. Um, my office printer decided not to work this morning. And so I am uh, reading the executive director report from my phone. I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, off on TikTok or anything. And so I, uh, this is the point in the meeting where the executive director, which is me, April Dawson Rawlings, uh, for those of you who are new voices in the room, this is the part of the meeting where the executive director upper op, uh, educates the commission about sort of high level operational and staff staffing and financial updates that are important for the, the running of the commission. And usually what I do is at the executive committee, I sort of drill down a little bit deeper um, and go a little, a little more into the weeds. And, and at this in this setting, I try to stay high, as high level as possible, but I'm certainly happy to you know go back and, and drill down in certain questions you have, as well as if there's an answer I don't have at the moment, I can get back to you at the next meeting. So I just want to share how that's sort of the style that I've been, since many of you are working with me for the first time. So in terms of program highlights, uh, and this is the period from October to uh, to now that um, we have uh, since, since our last meeting, is that one program highlight I want to lift up is that CCA partnered with part two of our listening forum for the city of San Jose. And in December, we hosted a webinar for small businesses and the disability community. It was modeled after our, our in-person listening forum in August, but we actually had, uh, for this one, it was more of a training component. So we had a local CASP giving a training. Uh, we also had a representative from the vision, Division of the State Architect who answered Q&A questions from small business owners. And we also had a really robust discussion uh, from, we had disability community leaders from the local independent living center as well as uh, chamber chamber and uh, local business representatives from Silicon Valley area. And there was a really rich discussion about, you know, how each, each community, even though those, we all know that's not mutually exclusive, there are business owners with disabilities and those kinds of things too. We're not just monoliths, right, in boxes. And, but it, I felt like the conversation really reflected that, that we're not all just our boxes that we put ourselves in. And I could really see just the respect in the room. And when, when I thought maybe the conversation might turn tense, it actually became really deep and meaningful talking about how people with disabilities see, how, how people with disabilities see their local business community and how the local business community might perceive people with disabilities. And they really, I felt grew from that conversation. And so I thought that was a perfect model for what our listening forums are trying to do. So I wanted to uplift that. In terms of commissioner vacancies, there is one vacancy on the commission as uh, as former immediate past chair uh, Guy Lemus indicated at the October meeting, he uh, he decided to uh, finish his last term, which expired on one one twenty four, and not uh, not uh, be available for a new appointment. 
um, because he felt that his time was, was complete on the commission and we thank him for his service. And we are planning to have a, uh, we will be planning a tribute to him in the near future. We wanted to do it in uh, closer to where he lives in, in uh, Southern California. So it would be easier for him to travel. So uh, I have been in touch with the Senate Rules Committee, which is the appointing authority for um, for that seat, it, re it's the represent, it represents the disability community uh, perspective, and um, they will be utilizing their internal consultants and with our engagement help to promote that opening to find someone in the disability community across California who could, who could be appointed to that seat to take over, to take that new term for a three-year term. In terms of reappointments, I'm excited to share that uh, Chair Downey and Commissioner Lillibridge were both reappointed by the governor to two to, to, to new three-year terms, and their Senate confirmations are moving through the process. And uh, also the Senate confirmations of Commissioner Shapiro and Commissioner Dr. Profatsa, who are both governor appointees, are also at different stages of, of the process as well and uh, moving through. In terms of staffing updates, uh, I, I'm happy to report that we conducted interviews the first week of March for our open program tech position, and we hope to have a hire onboarded by the beginning of April. And we also have a second opening for a hybrid SSA AGPA, that stands for Staff Services Analyst and Associate, Associate Governmental Program Analyst. Um, so what Abby and Abby is an AGPA and uh, Presley and Stephanie are SSA, so, so analyst positions. Uh, and they that position will um, further support our program efforts like with, uh, with our work with uh, the Division of State Architect on the DAR Fund and um, listening forums and other outreach efforts. And having making sure that we're fully staffed will allow us to um, not be as bogged down with administrative work and be able to spread the love <laughs> of all the work that it takes to be here. And um, so that position is currently posted. I don't believe it's closed yet because it just opened about a week or so ago. And so it closes today. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Phil just told me it closes today. And so that means we can look at the candidates and, and hope to have someone onboarded for that position by May at the latest. And so by, by May, we will be a fully staffed, staffed full commission. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. Um, in, ten, in terms of the presentations and conferences we've attended, I've attended, I'll just, I won't read them all, but I'll just, I try to be transparent and I always share a list of all the people that I've had meetings with in between meetings and also uh, share some of the highlights of the activities I do in the community. So I, I regularly meet, meet with Chair Downey on a monthly basis. I also meet with Commissioner Claire on, uh, we've been pretty consistent on a monthly basis also since uh, Commissioner Claire and her team provide quite a bit of technical knowledge and support for our technical projects and looking at it from that technical lens. Um, and we do a lot of work together on the DAR fund as well. And uh, I've met with Vice Chair Holloway as well. And I, I one of the things that we do is every executive in DGS has an administrative manager. And so, uh, and I think it's important to share with the commission sort of how, where we sit administratively to kind of see that, that picture. And so I meet monthly with uh, Deputy Director Jameson and he is actually sort of the link between, you know, I provide sort of the link between DGS and CCDA administratively and then he helps me move things up that need to be escalated and he's really been a really good voice for for us over the last several years so working with him and I also wanted to lift up that I went to a really great uh, disability or di diversity equity inclusion and access event that was featuring the first partner uh, Jennifer Siebel Newsom and it was it had a panel of state employees who talked about their experience of coming from different backgrounds. And it, it, was a, it was a workshop that was designed to bring leaders from different state agencies together to talk about how we could infuse DEIA into the work that we do. And um, I, I found it to be really informative. And I also met a lot of people from outside the DGS bubble, which was really great. 
And uh, quite a few of the panelists were also people with disabilities. So that was great to see that visibility. So um, those are some of the things that I've been working on, certainly not an exhaustive list, but some of the highlights. And when uh, staff is ready, I can move on to the financial report. And then I'm happy to take questions. And I'm just gonna wait a second for it to come up on the screen so that I can describe it. So you know what I'm reading. <laughs> if it's not on the screen, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a way to advance this? Thank you. <laughs> and I know it's really hard to, to visualize, so I will describe it. Uh, what is on the screen is a financial report. And uh, this was provided me to us by our budget analyst and reviewed by the budget analyst management. Um, and the reason why I say that is I think it's really important um, and a practice that I've always had that when, when reporting to boards and commissions that, that I work for, I always wanna make sure that the financials don't come from me because um, I want to make sure that I'm being transparent and um, not creating something that, that I have an influence in. So it's really important that, that financials come from a financial person, um, even if the director, executive director reports it. And the way that we use our money is really a reflection of our values. And so uh, I'm going to share uh, some really high level summary. And if you have questions about anything that is on uh, the financials that you have questions about, um, I'm only going to be talking about like the first four tabs. The other tabs are actually is actually sort of a worksheet um, because we are in, as you know, uh, many of you know, uh, but for those of you who may not, CCDA is on a July through June fiscal year with the state because we're part of the state of California. And we're at that part um, of the fiscal year where we're going to start talking about, you know, in how many, how many, how many of our funds we've we've utilized, whether to disencumber them, whether to you know move things around, how we need to spend funds down. Um, so this this particular financial report uh, that you'll that I'll be reading goes to the end of December. And it's very common, it's not unusual to be one to two quarters behind when an executive director reports financials. If I was more than that, I would I would have you be concerned and say something to me about it. Um, but that's just because it takes a while for, it takes one to two quarters to, to reconcile all the spending. So uh, for personal services, we have a uh, budget authority of $810,000. And through the end of December, it was reported that we spent 326,465 of those dollars. And so um, that personal services is like staff, but staff uh, benefits, those kinds of costs. For our operating, uh, you'll notice that in prior financial reports, I only shared uh, one source of funding. And so our for our 001 fund, which is our basic general fund, our uh, uh, spending authority is 1,562,000. But our 002 fund, so CCDA has two, two sources of funding. They're both general fund based, but they come from different pots of money. So the 001 fund is like your basic general fund. And our 002 is another word for, that's the code for the high frequency litigant fund that Commissioner Dr. Profatsa referenced earlier. Um, as of the end of December, that had $349,000 in it, which means that that raised our, uh, our, our total budget spending authority to um, a little over $1.9 million. And so our operating, um, although it, in the, taking out the high frequency litigant fund, it's, it's 752,000. When you add the high frequency litigant fund in, it's 1.1 million. And uh, year to date through the end of December, it was reported by budgets that we spent $222,276. I will tell you that we have a conversation uh, with budgets on Friday um, as part of, uh, again, that last quarter of the fiscal year, talking with them about our spending. Um, because there's some encumbrances that I don't think are, have been reported yet. And so I believe that we've actually spent um, more than this is reflecting um, because some of the encumbrances look like they hadn't been reported to their office yet and some of the spending from the encumbrances. 
And the word encumbrance is just a fancy budget word that means like money that you have tied up in like a contract or an invoice that you intend to spend. So I know one of the concerns that I've highlighted um, before is making sure that we're utilizing the, the, the resources that we are lucky enough to have. Um, a lot of our cost savings has been um, not just from, uh, from not just from having um, long term um, excuse me, long, long, long term, um, the two positions that weren't filled for a long time. So long term open positions has caused some cost savings. And also from operating a lot of the work that we do um, has been virtual over the last several years. And so a, lo and a lot of that has become part of our culture. So a lot of uh, the things that we thought we might have to spend a lot more money on, such as travel, you'll notice the travel category is very underspent just because we haven't needed to travel so much. Because So in terms of, of that, when you look at it from that perspective, we're doing a quite a bit of work um, and being smart with state dollars. Um, but I also wanna make sure that we're fully utilizing the resources available to us. So I just wanted to be candid about that as well. And so Phil and I are gonna be working with our budget analysts to make sure that we're being smart with those dollars and that at the end of our fiscal year, we're, we're spending down funds appropriately and, uh, and efficiently and keeping in mind that they come from taxpayers and, and court filings. So important places that uh, where the funds should be treated properly as, as people who represent the state of California. So I just wanted to share that and see if anyone has any questions about my executive director report or the financial report. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Uh, any questions or comments from any commissioner uh, joining us virtually? And Commissioner Jim, oh, not Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay, then. Any commissioner joining us in person uh, that would like to comment on, on this agenda item? Commissioner Jackson's getting her uh, microphone turned on. This is Commissioner Jackson. And I, um, I have a concern about when you, know, when you say that we don't spend our money down, but we're utilizing it. Um, I, I have been a contractor with the state of California and we were negatively impacted when we did not spend our money. We got lots of funding because we were able to ex expend the money. So do we lose it if we don't use it? Hi, Commissioner Jackson, this is April. So unlike a business or a nonprofit, we're not able to, to roll over funds or keep funds in a reserve. And, and so so if we don't if we don't utilize funds, it goes back into the general fund. Uh, we haven't been um, in the in the budget discussions that I've had. We're we're still receiving you know slight increases every year, so we haven't had resources taken from us. Um, and and we've actually been praised for our cost savings, but I also know that we we want to have that be a balance. So thank you. Comments from members of the commission? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication in the chat. Okay, thank you. So with that, if there are no further questions, we'll move on to agenda item 15. Discussion about uh, CCDA's outreach. And guess who? <laughs> Executive Director yes. April Dawson Rawlings. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just getting to, to the right page. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. So, as I mentioned in our prior, in my prior conversation uh, with some of these uh, topics, is that uh, CCDA has a social media pilot. So we have a six month social media pilot in partnership with the Office of Public Affairs at DGS. And um, in the past, prior to this pilot, 
we have been able to share um, share information about our events and our our outreach efforts, but just through the DGS logo and the DGS banner on their main page. And so we actually now, as of March 1st, CCDA has its own Facebook page and its own YouTube channel. And we, the pilot requires us to maintain 90 followers and post a minimum of three times a week for the next six months. And then, and then uh, the Office of Public Affairs is going to use that to decide um, if other organizations similar to CCDA um, should should have should be able to have their own um, own social media handles and then we may be able to gain um, gain the ability to have the username and password for for those um, but what's great about this pilot and also this is a huge step forward in that now we have the ability to uh, work with the Office of Public Affairs to really put out our own unique voice and speak directly to businesses and people with disabilities and other stakeholders, such as municipal governments. So um, we have, uh, so I, I highly encourage you to go to our Facebook page and to, to like us. Yeah, if you haven't already done so and follow us and, and you have the ability to comment on the work and also share it with your followers too. Also our YouTube channel, you may notice uh, when you go to our YouTube channel that we have quite a few historical videos. So we're starting to build a library where we really want to create a suite of videos that are um, that that could be really be a training library. Um, so our our commission meetings as well will start to be um, on YouTube as well as our subcommittee recordings. So our recordings will live there. And uh, all of our listening forums that municipalities feel comfortable with us recording, most of them have, um, some haven't, um, depending on the comfort level, but all of the ones that we can get recorded, we, we will, as well as all of our Pacific ADA webinar partnerships. And so people can go to our YouTube channel and learn cool facts about, about access, and we're really excited about that. On April 11th, uh, from uh, three to five, we are having a listening forum in Salinas. And so on the screen, there is a flyer. It says disability access for small businesses. And it says that it's at the County of Monterey Board of Supervisors Chambers. And um, we've sent that out to our stakeholders, but we can certainly send the flyer out if you need it again. Um, and it's co-sponsored by the County of Monterey Office of Civil Rights, as well as the California Build, Build Business Properties Association and, Build, and, a, and a local group called Building Business Back. And uh, refreshments start at two, and then there will be, that, that's provided by Building Business Back, and then there will be uh, a moderated panel similar to the one held in San Jose. Um, some of those details are still being finalized. We're still adding adding panelists because there's a lot of interest in this event. And again, there will be a Q&A portion that will allow uh, small businesses and others to ask their access questions. And there will be a, a representative from the Division of the State Architect there as well, as well as a training from a local CASP who is from who, who also is on the uh, County of Monterey's uh, Disability Commission. So we're excited about those local partnerships. And again, that will be on April 11th from three to five with uh, with refreshments starting at two. Uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of meeting with the Office of Disability for, for uh, the city of Los Angeles, and uh, Commissioner Dillard uh, was kind enough to be on that call as well. And so we um, are planning a future, a future um, event uh, with the city of Los Angeles uh, that is still in the early stages. And um, we also are... Um, gathering partners together for a future listening forum in Orange County. There have been some conversations about the possibility of tying it with our June meeting, but um, that hasn't been finalized yet, but we will be having a listening forum um, in that part of Los Angeles as part of our schedule. And uh, toward the end of the year, we will be hosting a listening forum in Sacramento, um, and it'll have both a regional focus and sort of a statewide focus also, because um, we don't want to forget that even though this is the capital city, it's also a region. Um, so there's there's people that don't just work at the capital who, who come here. So we want to make sure we're uplifting that as well. And um, on April 17th, from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., uh, we're partnering with the Pacific ADA Center 
uh, on a uh, ADA building blocks training for the city of Sunnyvale and businesses within the city of Sunnyvale. So sort of a mini listening forum of sorts. So we're, we're really excited about that. I also want to share that uh, we have uh, been developing a survey in partnership with the Division of the State Architect to gauge uh, the knowledge of municipalities on the, the DAR fund, um, as well as uh, we have uh, in the past, over the last year, I know I've reported on this in the past, but we've, we've developed a, a one pager about the DAR fund in partnership with the Division of the State Architect. And we have reached out to municipalities, particularly those who don't um, report how they're spending down the funds um, to the state architects uh, list and uh, where you could see how those funds are being spent locally. Some municipalities haven't turned in their reports. And so we reach out to them to see how they're doing. And uh, we have gotten some feedback back, but we're also hoping that our survey and our further outreach will help inform that. Um, so for those of you who don't know what the DAR fund is, that is a fund uh, where that is maintained locally, 90% 90, 90 of the funds are maintained locally, and the, the, the number one uh, use of it, it is meant to be, you know, the training and retention of CASPs, and also uh, the state legislature has allowed in the past legislative session to allow the use of the fund to also be for for uh, funds to allow small businesses to make access improvements, and so for example, the city of San Jose um, offers a grant program to allow uh, small businesses to apply for this grant program for a certain amount of dollars toward access improvements to make their businesses more accessible. And they're using part of their DARF funds for that. And uh, the other 10% is, is administrative. Um, and then uh, what's really great about it is that $4 of every, of, of every business license fee um, in the city or county, depending on how they set up their business license process, um, that's that's what funds that that money. And so that's an example of of a local of a fund that could be used by municipalities to increase you know, knowledge and access on their teams through the hiring and retention of CASPs, but also to make sure that businesses have some dollars for for accessibility improvements. And so, as we go forth with with our outreach and our social media pilot, we'll be uplifting. Uh, these these types of programs. So I'm really excited about the, the outreach that's been done and I, I welcome any questions and ideas for, you know, voices we could be reaching out to. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from members of the commission joining us virtually? Chair, Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. Thank you. Any, any questions or comments regarding uh, CCD out outreach? Uh, for members of the commission here in person. Uh, yes, this is Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, uh, Executive Director. Um, I was trying to see if I understood correctly. The plan visit that you're going to be having for, for presentation or conversion is LA City and not LA County? Well, we're going to be working with, with both, um, but um, we've been talking with representatives from the from the city most recent. Yeah, I want to recommend LA County, I suppose. Uh, that incorporates the whole mm -hmm, variety right. of cities. Mm -hmm. And while LA City does have significant uh, visibility, it would it would be more inclusive. Um, and I definitely encourage participation, but I would, if separate or to have LA County really be centered in this particular, uh, LA County, is, and uh, for consideration, definitely. Uh, but just because there's a significant difference, both um, in, in representation uh, and perhaps you'll be able to really maximize your efforts by going with the LA County Commission Disabilities uh, in conjunction with the LA City, because uh, there are two distinct small body. Uh, LA County is more bigger. LA City, while it has some statutory, it's very, very small. Uh, so I just want to highlight, um, recommend LA County Commission Disabilities and I'm on the commission. Oh, great. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. 
And definitely, definitely, that's a perfect example of how that the LA, the LA City meeting example was just one example of a meeting we've been to in that area. But we're planning to, you know, we to take different chunks of a really large geographic area to do the outreach as well. So we definitely, it's sort of like how Sacramento is not just like the capital and that's all people do. It's like LA is not just like you know going to Disneyland or mm -hmm. things like that. Plants in Anaheim, LA is not the capital, but LA County does the largest number of cities. Yeah. So particularly for our business partners, we have such a large chamber of commerce. Yes. So making sure we remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments from members of the commission? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Commissioner Downey, there appears to be no indication. Okay. There are no further comments. We'll move on to agenda item number 16, uh, the uh, regarding the legal portal. Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings. Back to you. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. I just wanted to give a, a first of all, I'll take a step back and share a little bit about what our legal portal is, just for new voices. Um, in the room and, and newer commissioners and public who may have not have heard this. And so I know I've shared before that one of our statutory um, obligations is to track uh, disability access, alleged disability access violations in the area of websites and um, disability access violations that are construction related um, through things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, the UNRU Act, um, and the Disabled Persons Act, for example. And um, so what, uh, so attorneys and law firms um, by law are supposed to send a copy of what, of the filing um, in from federal and st or state court uh, to our legal portal. Uh, we also uh, collect case resolution reports and other, other data that's attached to that particular case so that we could also track how it, how it resolves. And so it's it's a big undertaking, and we're we're very thankful for our partners at DGS who have helped us to. Um, in, in the past, many of you might remember, um, and I've heard stories about how we used to maintain first a paper database of all these things, as well as a Google database. With Google's awesome, but we now we have a database that's a little more user friendly and not like a spreadsheet. And uh, so we regularly make updates to make the legal portal easier to use. And one of the things that Stephanie does, um, who's the analyst who uh, works on the portal, is that she regularly talks with, with, with law firms who have trouble with um, who have trouble with the, the portal or who have questions about the portal to educate them. She'll do trainings for them. And she'll also talk with them about getting their ideas. If, if we start to see a pattern in, in difficulty with using the portal, we make those upgrades. And so some of the examples of, of some of the upgrades, I know I've shared this at a prior meeting, but um, I want to share again that we now have drop downs that specifically talk about uh, website accessibility in a more defined way. So in the past, we had, um, you know, I think it was like website accessibility other, or it was like a catch-all where if, if the person, if the law firm or, or lawyer wanted to post a, a website accessibility violation cop, uh, case copy, it would just be a catch-all of all the things that you could sue someone for, for website accessibility. And now they can go into a drop-down menu. And we had, um, we utilized attorneys and advocates and business people to come up with that list uh, in the drop down menu. So now we'll be able to, now that we're starting to be required to be reporting on those uh, violations, we'll be able to drill down on what exactly happened. Was it the contrast? Was it what, what allegedly happened? Was it the, allegedly the contrast? Was it, the, was it that the screen reader couldn't read it? Those kinds of things. So that we'll be able to educate businesses on what's trending with litigation in those areas. Um, so that they might get ideas for how to make their their websites more accessible and avoid some of those pitfalls that alleged that have been happening or alleged to happen. And so we added those website dropdowns. We also created a process that will make a public records act requests uh, easier. Um, so without going into too much 
without going into the specific details, we get we get uh, quite a few Public Records Act requests uh, for our data. Um, and a lot of times it's individuals wanting to wanting to check and see if a law firm has complied with the statute to report to CCDA. Um, and we and sometimes they want you know details of specific cases, and it's all public records, so it's usually pretty easy to do. But sometimes pulling that data can take time and be cumbersome, and so we've created a process. Uh, that would make it easier for us to pull that and get those uh, get those done faster for people that have those requests. Also, uh, we just created a patch that will that gives law firms the ability to search their own cases because sometimes they want to look for information and they can't remember if they 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 sent it to us or they have a question on a particular case and where, where it might be so that they can give us a more complete record, for example. So, so we've been making a lot of strides. Another project that we're working on is our key codes project. And so that's, that's uh, in the beginning stages. And um, we're looking at the key codes that we use for our violations and making sure that we're using the appropriate terms that match to the code. Because not only do we wanna make sure our key codes are the are 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 match with the code um, and are legally the right words to use for that violation, but also we want to make sure that the veracity of our data stays strong and to make sure that if our key codes use the right words and phrases, that it matches with the code and it also makes sense to the end user, which is the attorney or the law firm. And so, we have been working with uh, our consultant at ResD which is the real estate services division here at DGS, uh, who, who is a CASP to help us uh, come up with ideas for, for re revamping our, our drop-down menus. And we will definitely be uh, rolling that out slowly and uh, consulting with the, our end users to make sure that any rollout that we do doesn't take away from the end user ability to end user experience. And what we all want, the end goal that, th that we all want is to make sure that um, is to make sure that our data is is accurate. Um, and one of the one of the things that precipitated that is um, thanks to Commissioner Claire. When when Commissioner Claire was uh, reviewing our toolkits for us, um, she noticed that there were sometimes that 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 our use of certain certain uh, key code violations were attached to a different code than what we thought. And so we were kind of transposing some, some thoughts there. And so we, while we weren't technically, while we were still reporting the data as we understood it accurately, making sure everything matches up properly will make sure that we all know that certain words mean a certain thing and everybody knows what that certain thing is and agrees upon it. So we're excited about, about doing that and continuing to add to that. So we thank her for her efforts to point that out to us. And that led to, to, to this project. And so I'll be reporting on that at a future meeting. It's, it's in the beginning stages. And that's what I have for, for legal portal enhancements. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chair, Commission Downing, are there any comments from members of the commission, either virtually or in person? There is no indication online for virtual commissioners. Thank you. Are there any uh, members of the public uh, joining us virtually that would like to address this item? There is no indication in the chat. Okay. So uh, if I uh, had a chance to catch your breath, we'll move on. <laughs> Item uh, 17, the executive, um, executive director, no, no, it's the uh, annual report. Uh, yeah, the 2023 annual report. And that gets back to April Dawson Rawlings. Thank you. Uh, I do want to, I'll tie this in, but one thing I, I forgot to mention is um, that April Dawson and April Dawson Rawlings is the same person and that I'm in the process of a legal name change because I got married. Yay. And so, uh, you know, I need the applause. I'm just kidding. But I, uh, I just wanted to share that um, I thank you that I, uh, I am April Dawson Rawlings now and that I'm holding myself out to be that name. And that name is, uh, 
going to be um, on my HR paperwork very, very soon so that I can sign that name, but I'm holding myself out to be that person. And that's the same person you've always known, <laughs> just a little happier and sparklier. Um, and so I just wanted to share uh, a little bit about our annual report. This is a, this is a quick update. Um, I'm pleased to share that um, we are actually ahead of schedule compared to, to past years and getting our annual report out. Um, and so by the end of this week, we will have uh, finished all of the, all of the data is, 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 it takes a couple of months after the year closes, the, the calendar year closes for staff to go through all the data and make sure it's right and run tests. And I'm happy to report that we've, we've, we've done those tests and that by the end of this week, uh, our annual report draft will be um, at a place where we can send it off to, um, it goes through a, 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 a long and winding process through DGS and through different people in the legislature and um, office of, off, you know, the, the um, office of legislative affairs and others, uh, office of public affairs to make sure it's it's uh, ready for the legislature to look at. And then the legislature has, has its process. And so um, as soon as it's issued, the 2023 uh, annual report is issued, uh, everyone will get copies and it'll be posted on our website. And we also will be translating it into the different languages I spoke, uh, spoke up earlier. And uh, I look forward to uh, at a future meeting talking more in depth about the data that we collect and what it's, what it, the impact that it has on, on different industries and um, conversations that have been had. So I'm excited about that. So that's what I have to share about the, the 2023 annual report. Thank you. Thank you. This is Chair Commissioner Downey and uh, thanks uh, for, you for all that hard work and to the staff. Uh, Zubu does strike me as being um, much quicker uh, than in the past. So uh, good progress and good work uh, from all the staff. Uh, any comments from members of the commission, uh, whether virtual or in person? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication in the chat. Okay. Not hearing anything in the room. So are there any members of the public joining us virtually on this agenda item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication in the chat. Okay, we're racing right along. And uh, so now it's time for agenda item number 18, if I haven't missed it. Uh, and that's the uh, our next uh, full commission hearing, which will be held on June 26, 2024. And we've got our breath. Uh -huh. Executive Director April Dawson Rawlings has a few comments about that. Thank you. Uh, this is April. I just wanted to share that our next full commission meeting will be on June 26, 2024. It will be in Southern California. We are uh, we are 99 percent sure that it will be in the Orange County area near 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 an airport uh, near the airport there. But I want to make sure that we uh, we're still finalizing those those contracts. So I'm not going to say where it's going to be yet. But it it will be in Southern California more likely than not in Orange County, which will be a new place for us. We're also in, in conversations with uh, Orange County partners on the idea that our afternoon session could be a listening forum. Um, that again, hasn't been finalized yet, but it would be a way to leverage resources since we're already gonna be in that area and to, um, to, make, to make things a little more streamlined for people coming in and using meeting rooms and such. But, um, but again, if it doesn't happen on this state, we will have a Orange County forum in the future. So um, in the near future, but we're hoping that we can follow that model of tying listening forums with meetings since, and to also kind of increase our engage, that'll also help us increase our engagement with our main meetings as well. So we're hoping that that, that could be the plan, but plan on uh, hearing more about us about it soon. I also want to, I know this isn't quite the full commission meeting topic, but just a reminder if uh, to send in your form 700s um, and um, if you haven't already done so, and if you have questions, you can contact. Uh, staff aren't able to answer a lot of questions, but uh, we can connect you to the FPPC at, or at least help you with the link to where to go to submit that. So I'm tying that to the full commission meeting and I can tie it back since being a full commissioner, 
you need to do that to be a full commissioner. So that's how I'm tying the two together. So it's, it's legit, <laughs> but we're looking forward to seeing you on June 26th in Southern California. Thank you. Okay, I don't know that there'll be too many comments about this, but uh, I'll see if there are any from members of the commission, uh, either uh, virtual or in person. Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication virtually. And I'm hearing the rustling of the paper. People are getting ready around here. <laughs> so so uh, any comments from members of the public joining us virtually? Chair Commissioner Downey, there's no indication. Okay. So hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number 19. Uh, and that's uh, any future agenda items. So, so does any uh, member of the commission have any suggestions for future agenda items? I'll take those whether virtual or uh, in person. This is this is Commissioner Ramirez really quickly. I don't, I don't know if by then we'll get an update on the Section 504 updates, but if if they're available by then by the Department of Justice, perhaps maybe we could get some sort of guidance. And this was again, California submitted the most uh, public comments on Section 504 updates. Just gonna whoop, whoop. Any other comments from commissioners? Hearing Chair Commissioner or... Downey, there's no indication online. Okay. Uh, any uh, members of the public joining virtually that would like to address that item? Chair Commissioner Downey, there is no indication. Okay. Then uh, in this uh, on this topic, uh, just a reminder of our next. The next committee meeting is uh, outreach and education on April 4th. Let's see, 1.30 to 3, uh, 400 R Street here at the CCDA offices. We, was it two? Three on 312, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and we're wrapping up here, but before I do that, uh, I'd like to take the uh, liberty of uh, uh, extending a, uh, congratulations to Commissioner Ida Clare, who now has another uh, a letter at the end of her name. It's no longer just AIA; it's FIA AIA, which stands for Fellow of the Marriage, the College of American Architects of Institute of Architects College of Fellows. It's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous achievement and quite a significant recognition. So congratulations, Ida. Thank you so much, Commissioner Downey. All right. So with that, agenda item 20, can I uh, have a motion to adjourn? Nobody? Commissioner Shapiro will move. Commissioner Jackson, second. All right. Thank you. Any, no further comments. Uh, it is then time for a roll call vote, the last of the day. Thank you, Chair Commissioner Downey. Last roll call. Here we go. Uh, Commissioner Downey? Aye. Commissioner Dillard? Aye. Commissioner L. Hessen? Aye. Commissioner Holloway? Aye. Commissioner Jackson? Commissioner Jackson? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Leon Vasquez? Aye. Commissioner Lillibridge? Commissioner Profasa? Aye. Commissioner Ramirez? Aye. Commissioner Shapiro? Aye. Okay, and with that, Chair Commissioner Downey, I will pass it back to you. All CCDA commissioner votes have been noted. Thank you. The ayes have it. So. Thank you, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.